Number 10, grave robbing. Probably the most infamous crime of the time and today, really. The ancient Egyptians were many things and that included vain. There's a reason why they got Elizabeth Taylor to play Cleopatra, it all makes sense. The pharaohs of Egypt were buried with immeasurable amounts of treasures, gold, gems, jewels, swords, cats, dogs, just about everything but the kitchen sink. Once the tombs were sealed, the treasure was also sealed in there forever, or so they thought. That was until some crafty thieves broke into the tombs and slipped away with the loot. When a lot of Egypt was being discovered in the 1920s, it was unsure if the loot had been taken 10 years ago or 1,000 years ago. There's not really a way to know. And yes, it still happens to this day, and yes, it's awful. Leave it in there, it belongs to them, please. No more, no, no loot, Tim. Don't go loot, Tim, please. Number nine, bribery. Given that Egypt was one of the greatest civilizations the ancient world ever saw, it makes sense that they had it all. Currency, law, order. However, sometimes, well, sometimes these things just don't mix. Ever seen Better Call Saul? Yeah, exactly. They had a good system for the time and it was fairly concrete. However, like concrete over time, there's little tiny cracks that form, aka bribery. Oftentimes when facing serious charges against the pharaoh, there was an option to opt out of your sentence, just open your wallet and dish out some cash. This has worked in ancient Egypt, medieval Europe, 1920s America, and today. Say what you will, but the almighty dollar does have buying power. Number eight. Unaliving. If women of the evening partake in the world's oldest profession every night, then unaliving is the second thing we ever did. It's not really a profession, but it's we've been doing it for a long time. It's pretty sad, but it's true. Sure, it's always been frowned upon, but today we have a lot of rules, laws, and regulations regarding said rules, laws, and regulations about unaliving. It's bad. Don't do it. It was unfortunately more common than we think back in the day, especially amongst royals in ancient Egypt frothing at the mouth for the throne. But this is something that could have happened to anyone. Plus, in a time before CSI and guys throwing off their glasses to make very obvious low-hanging fruit jokes, well, if you didn't see the crime, then you probably wouldn't catch the crook. So people kind of just got away with it sometimes. Not all the time, but sometimes. Number seven, assassination. Related to my last point, nothing is true, everything is permitted. The creed of the assassins in one of my favorite video game franchises, at least up until they did Pirates. After that, it's... I was all kind of downhill after that. Well, despite the inaccuracies of the Assassin's Creed series has, like falling from great heights into bales of hay, the first known assassins just may have started in Rome and Egypt. More likely Egypt than spread to Rome, actually. Like a Sith, a lot of these early assassinations were for revenge, personal ambition, power lust, especially in the pursuit of success. Some were even part of larger plans. Now, it's one thing to be violent, sure, but to organize the destruction of a dynasty through the means of your knife, well, it's amazing what a couple inches of steel can accomplish. Who goes there? Someone's knocking on the door. We're good, okay, anyway, sorry. Number six, treason. Law and order in Egypt were associated with something called Mahat. I believe that's how you say it, which refers to truth and justice within society. Like I said before, great idea, great start, but more often than not, the ancient Egyptians had to fight off a lot of treason and corruption, uh, more than they like to admit it. Like when King Ramses III chose the heir to his throne, and uh, well, it wasn't who his wife had picked out, so there was going to be problems. There was a lot of wives, sons, and, and breeding, there's, con there's confusing lines. So in order to get what she wanted, she was going to stab him in the back. Literally. Well, her plot was unfoiled and her and all the conspirators were immediately unalive as punishment. There wasn't even a burial service as they were all thrown in the river afterwards. No amount of money or bribery could save them there. Number five, thigh or leg. Ever sit down at the holiday dinner table and your uncle's cutting the turkey and says, are you a thigh man or are you a leg man? <laughs> Except he says the same thing every Christmas and you can't wait for him to say it because that means you're another second closer to not being there. Anxiety is a heck of a thing, man. I don't have anxiety that bad. I'm just trying to relate to some of the people out there. I feel like I've been there with you. I don't know. Well, this was no Christmas and this certainly was no turkey, but people were talking about here. Yeah, we're talking about people. When someone was found to have done a serious enough crime, but not serious enough to be unalived, the authorities met in the middle by taking a leg. Oh god, that's awful. Now some of you might be thinking, well, I guess it's not that bad. You, you lose a leg and you move on, but imagine being held down and someone hacking your leg off with a bronze tool because steel doesn't exist yet. Oh, it's awful, awful, no good, no painkillers. Number four, homework. 
Homework, homework, homework. Homework, homework. Love it or hate it. Well, I actually hate it, and so did most of my friends. Some say it's needed in a modern world to teach efficiently. Some argue it doesn't do anything at all. I did my homework 90% of the time, believe it or not. And I know some, some of you are going to comment and say, oh, Chetty, no you didn't. I did. I really did. But when I didn't, I would usually come in and charm my way out of it. Hi, Mrs. Middleton. You look great today. You're the best. It worked most of the time. What can I say? Usually on, the, usually on the female teachers, it didn't work on the male teachers though. So. But the worst that would happen is that I would lose a percent off my grade here or there, but I just make it up back on the test, no problem. Well, scribes in ancient Egypt weren't so lucky. They were very important as they were literally the writers of the time. They, they described the history, it's pretty cool actually. However, if they chose to stay up all night and play Call of Duty like I did, well, their punishment was a more of the violent physical variety and not so much the stern talking to or I'm going to phone your mother variety. My mom didn't care. Number three, caning. Another creative punishment for crimes was caning of the feet, which is actually arguably the worst thing on this list. Since, you know, we use feet every time we walk or do something, you're gonna need a spot treatment after this one. A very simple process, the person is strapped down, feet exposed, a governing official then takes as many lashes to the feet as required. Painful, humiliating, and possibly dangerous. Cuts could lead to infection as we're walking around in heat, sweat, and well, some folks, if you're poor enough, just didn't have shoes. The worst I ever got that was a couple minutes in the timeout corner, except that my mom felt bad because I looked really cute and I was sad, and everything was fine. No spanking required. I was a good boy, I promise. There's some people don't think I was a good boy, but I really was a good boy. Number two, barbecue. I feel like the moment humans discovered fire, well, that fire hurts, we wanted to throw everything in it and see what happens. Now, I jokingly call this segment barbecue, but that's because it's really horrible. Famously, a group of rebels in ancient Egypt were immolated after trying to overthrow the pharaoh. Where after the barbecue from hell had finished, the pharaoh used these rebels as human torches. I, that's, oh, wow, okay. All Fantastic Four jokes aside, it was horrible, smelly, and cruel. Don't ever do this, please. Number one, adultery. Surprisingly, one of the most punishable crimes in ancient Egypt was being unfaithful, partly related to the lifestyle of Mahat and being truthful and just. It really makes sense. Just be a good boy. It makes a lot of sense, but some people don't follow that. The whole thing is bizarre because, well, no one really followed it, especially the royals. I mean, they had kids with their sisters and brothers and cousins and, and others and all, uh, just, it's messy. However, some folks did find themselves caught in this law, and when they did, they could succumb to anything on this list. For women, it was most likely the torch. For men, it was impalement and then being tossed into the river because, you know. Better keep those love notes to yourself, folks. Not worth getting burned over. It's it's not worth it. Just keep to yourself. Number 10, Mary the First. So this is a ruler who could have reserved a place in common history as the first woman ever to be, you know, the Queen of England. Instead, she is mostly remembered as B-L-O-O-D-Y Mary, a name she acquired because of her staunch and violent opposition to the Reformation. Look, the interwebs don't like the B word, so I had to spell it out. So I'm hoping you figured out what I was trying to say. The most controversial part of her reign was her religious policy. Despite promises a month into her rise to the throne that she would not pursue forced conversion of Protestants, Mary had leading Protestant churchmen imprisoned. She sought to reaffirm papal jurisdiction over England, and when the deal with Rome succeeded, the heresy acts were reinstated, which allowed for the burning of heretics. This sent a wave of fear through England, and around 800 Protestant nobles immediately fled the country. I wonder why. In February of 1555, well, um, the uh, executions began. Protestant Archbishop Thomas Cranmer was forced to watch the bishops Nicholas Ridley and Hugh Latimer being burned at the stake. Cranmer repented his Protestant faith and technically, under law, he should have been absolved as a repentant, but Mary refused to accept his absolution and had him burned at the stake as well just to, you know, Set an example, or for funsies. By the end of her terror, Mary had almost 300 people executed, most of them by burning at the stake simply for the crime of being Protestant. Her reign was relatively short, lasting a little over five years, since she passed in 1558 from either ovarian cysts or ovarian cancer and was succeeded by Elizabeth I. Number nine, Wu Zetian. 
Look, I know I said in the title of today that I'd be talking about evil queens, but I support all women's wrongs. And rulers in other countries tend to have different titles to their equivalent of queens. So Wu was born to a relatively wealthy family and had extremely progressive parents, becoming well versed in a wide range of subjects including writing, music, literature, and perhaps most importantly, politics and governmental affairs. By the age of 14, Wu was summoned to the imperial palace to become a concubine of Emperor Taizong. After his passing, the newly anointed Emperor Li Zi, the youngest son of the late emperor, who became Emperor Gaozong, brought Wu to the imperial court to be his own concubine. I'm not going to unpack that. In 654, Wu bore a daughter, but shortly after the birth, it passed, with evidence showing um, strangulation. So Wu accused Empress Wang of the death, and Wang lost favor with the emperor. The most popular theory is that Wu actually uh, did the act to her own daughter. So thereafter, the emperor conferred with his chancellors, and despite opposition, demoted Wang, having her imprisoned, and promoted Wu to empress. Later on, the emperor considered having Wang released, but Wu had her executed upon hearing this, because, you know, can't have any witnesses. Upon her accession to the throne, Wu began targeting officials who had opposed her rise to power, having them arrested and imprisoned, exiled, forced to take their own lives, or or executed. In 664, she accused several officials of witchcraft and had them uh, executed as well, and their families became slaves within the imperial palace. In another incident, she killed her niece with poison, accused two others of the death, and executed them. She eventually passed after repeated bouts with illness, so nothing nefarious there. Number 8, Isabella of Castile. So when Isabella was born on the 22nd of April in 1451, there was little chance she would ever become monarch of Castile, as she was very far removed from the direct royal lineage. War, politics, and subterfuge intervened, however, and for many years, the Kingdom of Spain was in turmoil, suffering from civil wars and uh, a lot of chaos. To quell one of the rebellions, the hand of Isabella was promised to the commoner, Pedro Duran Acuna Pacheco, but on his way to her, he suddenly fell ill and, um, passed. Now, this immensely fortuitous event for Isabella cemented her devotion to her faith, since she didn't exactly want to marry a commoner and prayed for divine intervention. Her marriage to Ferdinand, heir to the thrones of Castile and Aragon, cemented her future power. After the death of the King of Castile, the throne was given to Isabella. Her cruelty is recognized in the treatment of non-Christians, which led to the formation of the Spanish Inquisition, known for its extreme brutality and torture of mostly Jewish and Muslim folks. Isabella waged war on the Kingdom of Granada, the last Muslim kingdom in Spain, and the last piece to fall in the Spanish Reconquista. While some may see it as the liberation of Spain, for many others, it was open genocide. By the time Granada was annexed, 100,000 Muslims were either dead or enslaved. Number 7, Catherine de' Medici. I'm chuckling, but I'm glad my obsession with rain in high school is about to come in handy. So serving as the Queen of France from 1547 to 1559, Catherine had enormous political sway over her sons, the French kings Francis II, Charles IX, and Henry III. They reigned through the French wars of religion and faced problems with a group of Calvinist Protestants called the Huguenots. It is widely believed by historians that Catherine attempted to have their leader, Gaspard II de Calais, assassinated. The attempt failed, and fearing retaliation from the most powerful folks in power, Catherine planned to kill them all before they could take action. The result was the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, which resulted in the deaths of between, oh, 5,000 to 30,000 Huguenots. Number 6, Lady Elizabeth Bathory. Born in 1560 on a family estate in royal Hungary, Elizabeth was of noble lineage and privileged with education, wealth, and a lofty social rank. Her first taste of the morbidly bizarre was introduced to her during the early years of her life when she suffered seizures which might have been epilepsy. Treatment at the time for such bouts included feeding the patient human redness and bits of skull from a non-sufferer. She bore witness to brutal punishments and executions carried out by her father's officers and was influenced by family members involved with Satanism and witchcraft. When she was barely in the double digits of age, Elizabeth was engaged to Count Ferenc Nadasi, who she later married. Her husband spent much of his time away from home fighting the Ottomans, leaving Elizabeth to run the estate. Her Satanism became more pronounced as time wore on, and upon the death of her husband in 1601, her vicious crimes escalated. Most of her victims were girls around the age of the time she got married, and were usually the daughters of lesser gentry who had been sent to court to learn etiquette. Her favorite punishment methods including using pins to stick under her victims' fingernails and covering her victims in honey and leaving them out to be eaten by ants and other insects. Other methods included whipping her victims with nettles and frequently burning body parts, especially genitalia. 
After burning her victims, she would dump them in icy water. Many of them uh, were punished to the point of death, some of whom were buried in unmarked locations, and some sources even claim she engaged in people munching making that her darkest secret. Elizabeth and a few of her servants were eventually arrested in 1610, and her accomplices were put on trial in 1611. With over 300 witness accounts and numerous testimonials, a guilty verdict was assured. A servant girl who claims to have seen evidence in Elizabeth's private books stated that her victims were around 650 folks. The accomplices were sentenced to death, and Elizabeth was confined to a bricked up room with slits for air and delivery of food. She was found dead a couple years later. Number five, Marie Antoinette. So France's queen between 1774 and 1792 was Marie Antoinette, who was you know, the last queen before the French Revolution. She had quite the reputation for splurging on expensive things and found herself in quite a few scandals. One in particular was the affair of the diamond necklace. So Countess de Lamotte, a young lady, pretended to be the queen's friend and entered the French court in 1785. She fooled a high society member into believing that Antoinette loved him. She even hired a buy selling worker and disguised her as the queen and convinced the man that uh, Marie wanted to purchase a diamond necklace. The jewelry cost around 1,600,000 livres then, which is almost $12 million today. The money was never paid, and the queen had no clue about what had taken place, but even though she was innocent, the public still despised her. Granted, she's mostly known for her infamous dialogue. When French subjects could not afford bread, she said, let them eat cake, which fueled the French Revolution and ultimately led to her um, execution. Number four, Queen of Castile. So Juana La Loca was the Queen of Castile from 1504 to 1516, and she suffered from various mental disorders. After her husband passed in 1506, her father buried his body. However, Juana used to open the tomb and caress her husband's dead body. And ultimately, she ordered the body dug out and kissed her husband's feet. Additionally, she would carry his coffin everywhere with her and actually kept it under her bed. Years later though, she eventually allowed his burial outside her window. Look, I just keep weird dolls under my bed. Number three, Maria Eleonora of Brandenburg. Maria Eleonora, born on November 11th of 1599, passing eventually on March 28th of 1655, held the title of Queen of Sweden from 1620 to 1632 as the wife of King Gustav II Adolf. Coming from a noble German family, she belonged to the prestigious house of I'm not even gonna try and say that. However, when Maria and Gustav gave birth to a girl with a genetic condition causing excessive hair growth, Maria was deeply shocked. The unexpected appearance of her daughter, combined with uh, societal beauty expectations, pushed Maria to her limits. She considered her daughter ugly and refused to care for what she perceived as a monstrous creature. When Gustav died when Christina was only um, this many years old, Maria blamed her for his death. For over a year, Maria subjected Christina to very harsh punishment, confining her to blacked out, darkened rooms to mourn her father in solitude for very extended periods, even placing her father's open casket in Christina's room and demanding she sleep next to it, which that's way too morbid, even by my standards. Maria's mental state deteriorated, eventually leading to Christina's removal from her custody. So thank goodness for Christina. Number two is Sixty the Dragon Lady. So the story of her rise to power is a remarkable one. Born at a time when Chinese women were politically invisible, this lady managed to acquire enormous political influence by exploiting her position as a royal concubine, engaging in court intrigues and manipulating those around her. By the end of the 1860s, she had become the most powerful individual in China. Her will and her reach even exceeded two male emperors, who she frequently bypassed or overruled. Now, she was originally born Lan Kuo in 1835, the daughter of a minor Manchu official, and at age 15, she was selected as a potential concubine for the emperor and relocated to the Forbidden City. She was elevated to the status of concubine of officially by age 18, eventually giving birth to the emperor's only son, Zhechun, a feat that earned her another promotion in the palace hierarchy. The emperor died in 1861, and shortly after the disastrous Second Opium War, left the throne to his only son. So as the mother of the reigning emperor, Sixie was given the courtesy title Dowager Empress. So by this point, the empress had become quite adept at manipulation, palace intrigues, and power games. Through forged evidence and false testimony, she engineered the arrest of the eight ministers, three of whom were later executed. With the Regency Council gone, the empress became the de facto regent for the duration of her son's reign, until his early death from smallpox in 1875. The empress was instrumental in the succession, choosing her young nephew Zetian, who was crowned as emperor. So 
so once again, this dowager empress acted as regent to the infant emperor, this time in a more formal capacity. Twelve years into the young emperor's reign, our empress moved to the summer palace in Beijing and surrounded by a network of informants and advisors doted on by loyalists and conservatives in the bureaucracy and military, she continued to exert enormous influence on appointments, policies, and matters of state. Stories of the empress's extravagance are prevalent, since it has been claimed that she regularly increased her personal and food allowances, uh, that she withdrew gold and silver from dwindling national reserves, and spirited millions of pounds offshore into bank accounts in London. Other tales of her exorbitant spending include her decision to spend 10 million silver teals, uh, some set aside to rebuild the Chinese navy, on the renovation of one of her palaces. Another rumor claims that 3,000 ebony boxes were needed to restore her jewelry collection. Number 1. Agrippina the Younger So Julia Agrippina, also referred to as Agrippina the Younger, was a Roman empress from 49 to 54 AD, the fourth wife and niece of Emperor Claudius and the mother of Nero. After the death of her first husband, Agrippina tried to make shameless advances to the future emperor, Galba, who showed no interest in her and was devoted to his wife. On one occasion, Galba's mother-in-law gave Agrippina a public reprimand and a slap in the face before a whole bevy of married women. She was one of the most prominent women in the Julio-Claudian dynasty, functioning as a behind-the-scenes advisor in the affairs of the Roman state via, you know, the powerful political ties. She maneuvered her son Nero into the line of succession, and Claudius became aware of her plotting, but died in 54, and it was rumored that Agrippina uh, poisoned him. She exerted a commanding influence in the early years of Nero's reign, but in 59 she was killed. Both ancient and modern sources describe Agrippina's personality as ruthless, ambitious, violent, and domineering. Number 10, the oldest profession in history. Alrighty folks, we're kicking off today with a nice dose of internet no-no words, so bear with me here. If I sound convoluted, you know why. The Middle Ages in Europe witnessed a universal paradox of tolerance and condemnation with regards to the selling of one's body services. While well, technically a sin because it hinged on the act of fornication, this act was recognized by the church and others as necessary or a lesser evil. It was accepted as fact that young men would seek out sexual relations regardless of their options and thus this profession served to protect respectable townswomen from seduction or worse. In 1358, the Grand Council of Venice declared that this field was absolutely indispensable to the world. In general, declarations proclaiming the necessity of this line of work were not quite so enthusiastic. The church didn't hesitate to denounce it as morally wrong, but as St. Augustine explained, if you expel it from society, you will unsettle everything on account of lusts. So, you gotta have it. It just wasn't exactly ideal back then. Number 9. Hunting Witches Witch hunters often had their suspects stripped and publicly examined for signs of an unsightly blemish that witches were said to receive upon making their pact with Satan. Now, this devil's mark could supposedly change shape and color and was believed to be numb and insensitive to pain. And more often than not, women were both the witches and the witch hunters. And in these cases, it was easy for even the most minor physical imperfections to be labeled as the work of the devil himself. Moles, scars, birthmarks, sores, and tattoos could all qualify, so examiners rarely came up empty-handed. If found guilty, witches would be sent through a series of trials and punishments, starting with the scold bridal. Also known as a witch's bridal, a gossip's bridal, a brank's bridal, or simply branks, this was an instrument of public humiliation. It was an iron muzzle in an iron framework that enclosed the head, some exceptions were masks that depicted suffering, but not pleasant either way. Oh, you want me to elaborate? Alrighty, folks. A bridal bit or cur plate around 5 cm by 2.5 cm in size was slid into the mouth and pressed down on the top of the tongue, often with a spike on the tongue as a compress. Ouchie. It functioned to silence the wearer from speaking entirely and cause extreme pain and physiological trauma to scare and intimidate the wearer into submission. Now, this prevented speaking and resulted in many unpleasant side effects for the wearer, including excessive salivation and fatigue in the mouth. Seeing how I've always been a chatty cat, I would have been sentenced to this, and my jaw ah, hurts thinking about it. The wearer was then led around the town by a leash, and for extra humiliation, a bell could also be attached to drawing crowds. It was used as corporal punishment for other offenses, notably on female workhouse inmates, and the person to be punished was placed in a public place for additional humiliation, and who knows what else. I'm sure you can put two and two together. There's things I cannot say. Number 8. Bathing in what now? Aptly named the B-L-O-O-D Countess, Elizabeth Bathory was a Hungarian noblewoman and was one of the most prolific female serial killers of her time. At the end of the 16th century and beginning of the 17th, she tormented and killed up to 650 young women at her castle in is what now known as Slovakia. The macabre nickname came from her apparent tendency to bathe in the redness of her victims as she believed it would help her maintain her youthful looking skin. I'll stick to my Epsom salts and the occasional bath fizzy. Oh, and my cleansing routines. Look, I swear my one cleanser from the ordinary might look suspicious, but it's not human red. I just play a vampire professionally, folks. I'm not an actual one. Or maybe. 
Number 7. Serfdom In most Middle Ages communities, the king technically owned all the land in an area. He would lease it out to noble barons in exchange for an oath of their loyalty, and then these nobles had the freedom to govern their land and impose taxes as they pleased. Yeah, as you can expect, they were pretty brutal about it. This privilege for the few landed barons came at a great cost to the serfs. Now, This was the poor mass of people who had no land and no rights. They were essentially treated as slaves by the local nobles, and they toiled on the land and brutally worked six days a week from dawn until dusk. Per the feudal system, they were forced to produce crops, raise livestock, and offer some value you know, to pay their liege lord for the use of the land. And the grind never ended. If you were born into the lower class, it was extremely likely you would remain there for your entire life. There was no social mobility or opportunity to work through one's birth position. Instead, the poor, unwashed masses simply kept working hard and toiling away with no chance of ever improving their lives. If that's not evil, I don't know what is. Number 6. Getting married way too young Yeah, medieval females obtained the status of married woman very early. At the age of a girl reached the age of majority and was entitled to marry. Now, in this scheme of things, the choice of her future husband was based entirely on her parents' will. No wonder marriage sanctioned by the law of the church should not be a nightmare for many wives. Under civil law, a husband was permitted to moderately physically harm his wife. Actually, a medieval tradition advised a husband to treat his wife as a pupil. So like, teach her her place. So a lot of desperate women, therefore, uh, killed their husbands. The legislation of those times had detailed regulations governing punishment for women who had killed their husbands. They were sentenced to death by burning alive or burning at the stake. Kind of like a witch. Creative, but not really. Number 5. Have more than 10 offspring Yes, I know this can be a touchy subject, so just bear with me here. I'm not calling giving birth evil by any means, or having multiple offspring by choice evil. I more mean that back in the day, it was a woman's job to essentially reproduce as many offspring as possible to help around the home and to continue on the family name. As somebody who has zero interest in ever reproducing, and that is my personal choice, I have many friends who have, and I will be a fantastic aunt, the thought of giving birth once is terrifying, never mind that often. I read about a lady who had 17 offspring, and sure, while some of those might have been multiple births, I can't even imagine the pain. Or also just raising that many little ones, being responsible for that many little ones, the stress, no thank you. All the props to them, but evil because they were forced to, not because they wanted to. Number 4. Take up the waste After that last one, let's start this point with a fun fact, shall we? So, the British word for toilet, loo, derives from the French garder l'eau, with meaning, you know, watch out for the water. Gardez l'eau, je parle français. <laughs> this comes from the fact that, well, in medieval Europe, people simply threw the contents of their chamber pots out of the window onto the streets. Now, before throwing the waste out of the window, they'd yell, gardez l'eau. The term gardez l'eau first came to English as gardez l'eau, and then shortened to Lou, which eventually came to mean the toilet itself. People in the Middle Ages were no less sensitive to foul odors or disgusted by human waste than we are. They also didn't understand exactly how human waste could spread disease, but they knew it, you know, did. They just thought it was something to do with its odors. And hey, while we're on the topic of hygiene, in the early Middle Ages, women passionately cared about personal hygiene. Many townspeople took a bath, and there were a lot of bathhouses in towns. But due to the total victory of Christianity, life kind of changed. With all bathhouses being public, the church viewed it as a violation of moral standards. So then they closed them, and then untidiness was elevated to the level of virtue. Look, I'm a bit of a Christianity hater, so I'm just gonna leave that one be. Number three, V Day traditions. So during medieval times, they believed that if a young woman ate strange food on Valentine's Day, she'd dream of her future husband. And at a time where normal meals were delicacies such as a boar's head sewed onto a turkey's body, these weird meals were, well, extra weird. The roasted hedgehog was just one of the bizarre foods that these young women would enjoy in hopes of seeing visions of their future Valentines. Yeah, okay, because that's gonna make me gag. How about we do a little palate cleanser before we move on to the next bad thing? So other sayings that were popular at the time was if you saw a bluebird, you would marry a happy man. If you see a gold finch, you're gonna marry a millionaire. And if you see a sparrow, you're marrying a poor man. If you find a glove on the road on Valentine's Day, your future beloved will have the other missing glove. Now by the 18th century, gift giving and exchanging handmade cards had become common practice. In England, handmade cards incorporating lace and ribbon became popular. And eventually this form of gift spread to the American colonies and into our traditions today. Also, it was found to be terrible luck to sign your name on a Valentine's Day card. And the superstition must have been very confusing for some folks, but convenient for others. As well as cards and flowers, the next gift to become popular was the giving of chocolates. And this can be traced back to Richard Cadbury of, yes, the famous chocolate-making family, who invented the first Valentine's Day candy box. Now, as those grew in popularity, chocolates started to be given in decorated boxes filled with, you know, romantic imagery. I remember my first boyfriend got me a box back, way back when, it was a box of chocolates. I think my mom still has the box, because it was a really pretty box. Number two, institutionalized. Okay, folks, back to the icky stuff. Being sent away was a way to impose a pious life of no ownership or wealth, sexual relationships, any devotion to God, and administer health care and alms to the most unfortunate in society. In reality, it didn't always work. It was a way of kings, lords, and earls banishing troublesome wives, you know, just to get them out of sight, out of mind. They could even do it to uh, young that they didn't want to have around. Just a way of cleansing the soul, if you'd like. Hey, look, 
If we're looking at like the upside, a woman from aristocracy only had two options in life. Marry a man who could support you or join a nunnery. Now virginity was an integral requirement for a nun in the very early medieval period because physical purity was considered the only starting point from which to reach spiritual purity. A nun was expected to wear simple clothing as a symbol of her shunning of worldly goods and distractions. The long tunic was typical attire, with a veil to cover all but the face as a symbol of her role as a bride of Christ. The veil also hid her hair, which had to be kept cut short. Nuns could not leave their nunnery in contact with outside visitors, especially men. That was kept to an absolute minimum. No temptation here. Granted, life isn't perfect. There was a couple of little scandals. I know there's one in mid-12th century, where at the Gilbertine Watton Abbey in England, a lay brother had a sexual relationship with a nun, and on discovery of the sin, was castrated. It's kind of a common punishment of the period for that type of crime. Can we bring it back? Not for cheating, but for bad things. Number one, take care of the monthly visitor. As someone who's currently dealing with my regular monthly episode of cramping and being a miserable witch, how women had to deal with this in history before modern products is very much evil in my book. So it was very much a vastly different experience than it is today. To start, medieval women had fewer periods than today's women. Poor nutrition and hard work meant that they had very low body fat, and a woman needs to have some sort of it, or her reproductive system slows down and menstruation ceases. In our modern words, for example, a medieval woman could use a makeshift, you know, pad or tampon. Pads are made of scrap fabric or rags, hence that's where the phrase came from. Cotton was preferred though, because the material absorbs fluids better than the alternative, which was wool, which is also like itchy and uncomfortable. There is some archaeological evidence to show us that some women may have worn panty-like garments, and they could also wind cotton fabric around a twig, and uh, you make it that what you will. Interesting side note though, a common type of bog moss found throughout medieval England. Now the long official name I can't say, but the popular name was B-L-O-O-D moss, and people realized that they could use it in the battlefield as first aid. So you know, put two and two together. Also, the main reason why uh, medieval petticoats came in red, it was fashionable, decorative, but it was good at disguising accidents. Number 10, Ted Kaczynski. As a young man, Kaczynski was a mathematic prodigy and at Harvard University, he underwent psychological experimentation designed to harm and humiliate subjects, which may have been part of the CIA's mind control program, aka MK Ultra, as he began to have a promising career at UC Berkeley, then suddenly resigned and retreated to the wilderness, determined to fight industrialization and the destruction of nature. Between 1978 and 1995, he mailed and delivered explosives to targets of tertiary institutions and aviation companies across the country, killing at least three people and injuring 23. The FBI dubbed him the University and Airline Bomber, leading to the nickname the Unabomber. A manhunt finally caught Kaczynski in 1996, after which he was given eight life sentences. Number 9, Henry Kissinger. Considering he was a very notable figure in American politics, his choices in regards to political American policies involving foreign affairs were extremely costly and disregarding of human life. When the Vietnam War exploded in 1955 and lasted till 1975, it had been noted that it was America's longest and most expensive war that had occurred in that era. At this time, there had been at least four noted US presidents, and Henry Kissinger acted as a Secretary of State for both Nixon and Ford. In regards to the conflicts between the North and the South Vietnam over the control of which mega empire would rule, this side more in Asia, whether the USSR in the North, Americans in the South, that backing that could have technically liberated the South Vietnamese was costly as it was noted to be up to another potential $700 million. But Kissinger, despite him stating in reports he wished Congress approved his call to liberate the South Vietnamese, he happened to also make deals behind closed doors with their leaders, sacrificing them for the US POWs held hostage in the North. But also considering it was expensive and they needed oil, the Middle East were having conflicts after the Nakba that occurred in Palestine, how the colony Israel had taken over lands, and in order for the US to get oil, Kissinger had to write to Israel to release some of the lands so they could, that they colonized back to the Arab nations so that the US could get oil to continue their war in Vietnam. But the sympathy towards the South Vietnamese dwindled, not just economically but socially, when people went into the streets yelling for the government to stop funding this war, killing civilians not just the American young men forced into the war and developing PTSD later, but the hundreds of thousands of innocent Vietnamese that had also died. Kissinger had the gall to also say to President Ford in a quote, if you do that, the American people will go in the streets again, and referring to the Vietnamese, why don't those people die faster? The worst thing they can do is linger on. Yeah, he said that. As a result, the $700 million that could have liberated the South Vietnamese mysteriously was rejected by 76 congressmen into the Senate and went towards the colony Israel instead. As well as in regards to the Bangladesh Liberation War, Kissinger sneered at the people who bled for the dying Bengalis and even called Indians bastards. Hmm, nice guy. 
Number eight is Harvey Weinstein. For sure, this guy is pretty new for the history books, but he will for sure be mentioned in law books in regarding to blackmailing, coercion, and so much more messed up stuff like physically harming and harassing women and threatening their career. As a former Hollywood film producer, he became the center of a high profile criminal case that brought attention to issues of harassment and physical harm in the entertainment industry. The allegations against Weinstein were a catalyst for the Me Too movement, a social media campaign encouraging survivors of harassment and harm to come forward with their experiences. The movement shed light on the widespread issues of misconduct and Various industries, Weinstein faced a high profile trial in New York in early 2020, and the trial included testimony from multiple women who accused him of misconduct. On February 24, 2020, Weinstein was then convicted of physical non consensual harm in the third degree and criminal act in the first degree. He was then acquitted for more serious charges, including predatory harm. Number seven, Ed Gein. Ed Gein, also known as the Butcher of Plainfield or the Plainfield Gowl, was an American killer and body snatcher who gained infamy for his gruesome crimes in the 1950s. His activities served as a partial inspiration for. For various fictional serial killers and books and films. Gein's crime was discovered in 1957 when police investigated the disappearance of a hardware store owner, Bernice Warden. During a search of Gein's property, they found Warden's decapitated body hanging in Gein's shed, dressed out like a deer. Dressed, like skinned. Further investigation revealed a house of horrors as Gein was a grave robber who exhumed corpses from local cemeteries. He admitted to creating a variety of items from human body parts, including clothing, furniture, and masks. Gein's gruesome artifacts shocked the public so much and Fueled sensationalized media coverage, and Gein was suspected in the disappearances of two other individuals, but only two deaths were definitely linked to him Bernice Warden and his own brother, Henry Gein. Ed Gein was declared mentally unfit for trial and spent the rest of his life in psychiatric institutions. He was then diagnosed with schizophrenia, and his confinement included time in the Central State Hospital for the criminally insane in Wapon, Wisconsin, later in a mental health institution. He was kind of inspired for that chainsaw massacre thing as well. Number six, Clementine Barnabet. Clementine Barnabet was an American woman who gained notoriety in the early 20s. Century for alleged involvement in a series of deaths in Louisiana. Barnabet claimed to be a member of a religious cult led by her father, Raymond Barnabet, and she asserted that the cult believed in cleansing the world by killing those that seemed sinful. Between 1911 and 1912, a series of brutal axe deaths occurred in Texas and Louisiana, and Barnabet confessed to being involved in some of these killings. In 1912, Clementine was arrested along with her father, two brothers, and the connections of these deaths. She confessed to her involvement in the crimes, claiming that she and her family were carrying out God's works, killing sinners. It was a job. Barnabet confession came under scrutiny as some believed it might have been coerced or influenced by her father, but uh, there were also doubts about the accuracy of her statements. And uh, regarding the number of victims and her role in the killings, Clementine Barnabet then went to trial for her alleged um, involvement in the crime. In 1913, she was found guilty and sentenced to prison, and her father and brothers were also convicted, but more of a lengthy sentence. Clementine Barnabet spent the rest of her life in prison and was never released, thankfully. And the circumstance surrounding the crime and remains a controversial and still unsolved or unresolved. Number five, Jeffrey Epstein. I know a lot of folks know this man is a greedy, nasty, rich jerk who lived in a vile organization, allowing other rich, nasty folk to take advantage of the young and vulnerable. But as the ringleader of a trafficking and harming of young women everywhere, apparently in 2008, Epstein pleaded guilty to state charges in Florida for soliciting and procuring a person under 18 for adult work, meaning under 18, young adolescents, like the age of 12 or 14. He then reached a plea deal that allowed him to avoid federal charges and served only 13 months in jail. This lenient deal orchestrated by the then US attorney Alexander Acosta later then became a subject of public scrutiny. Which as it should, considering why is the US so lenient on crimes on young people? Like people that the law should protect. And then finally, 10 years later after who knows how much more damage and crime he's committed, in July 2019, federal prosecutors in New York arrested Epstein on trafficking charges. They accused him of exploiting and abusing dozens of underage girls and the arrest following the unsealing of a new indictment but by then 2020 somehow he died in his cell. Some say he took his own life and others, well when it comes to controversy, that they didn't want him to talk. After all, the nature of his relationships and the extent of his activities fueled public outrage. He wasn't alone in this after all, he needed someone else to lure these young underage individuals. So Ghislaine Maxwell, you know her, was also charged and arrested. Investigations into Epstein's activities and the circumstances surrounding the 2008 plea deal continued. Legal actions against his estate and those connected to him remain ongoing, reflecting the broader effort to seek justice for their victims. Number 4, Joseph James Delangelo. Joseph James Delangelo, also known as the Golden State Killer, is an American serial killer and caused this YouTube, because I gotta be very discreet, physically violated people, if you know what I mean, who terrorized, Cal uh, who terrorized California in the 1970s and 1980s. D'Angelo's crime was initially attributed to several monkeyers, including East Area Harmer and Original Night Stalker, unlike Richard Ramirez, another serial killer and vile man. His crime
program initially began in the Sacramento area before spreading out to other parts of the state. D'Angelo's modus operandi included breaking into homes, often targeting couples. I guess he was just jealous. He would tie up and harm the victims, committing non consensual harm and then theft. In later crimes, he escalated to killings, earning him the nickname the Golden State Killer. The, the case remained unsolved for decades, but advancement in DNA technology played a crucial role in solving it. In 2018, investigators used a public gene genealogy website to identify distant relatives of the suspect and eventually led them to Joseph James D'Angelo. D'Angelo was arrested on April 24, 2018, at his home in Citrus Heights, California, and he was identified through DNA evidence and genealogical research. At the time of his arrest, D'Angelo was also, get this, a former police officer, which added to an extra layer of shock to the case. In August 2020, D'Angelo was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, and the sentence marking the conclusion of one of the most notorious unsolved criminal cases in US history. Number three, Nathan Bedford Forrest. What a name. There's so many interesting names on this list. Nathan Bedford Forrest was a prominent Confederate general during the American Civil War. Unsurprisingly, given his culpability in the Ford Pillow Massacre in April 1864 and the formation of the Triple Ks, Forrest and his image may have come under attack by many sectors, especially from African Americans. The Triple Ks embarked upon a campaign of intimidation and violence against Southern blacks and Republicans until Forrest ordered the organization to disband it in 1869. Nevertheless, the local chapters of the Triple Ks continued to be active and Forrest was ordered to appear before congressional hearing in 1871 and his sometimes contradictory testimony he denied he ever had membership in this organization yeah you're He's the one who had the receipt. A combination of age, exhaustion, and conversation to Christianity may have caused the Forrest's fiery temper and racial attitudes to his moderate and later years. Number two, Samuel Little. Apparently noted the most discreet but also most vile crime committing killers. The reason why he was able to get away with over killing 93 women was because of the time or the height of these deaths. Majority, if not all, of these women were women of color who worked as adult workers. And because in the 70s, law enforcement didn't prioritize people of color or the occupation of working as an adult worker, any case of missing persons from from both of these factions as a cohesive was met with dismissal. So Samuel, who had a blood thirst for control and death, committed to these crimes only to these main demographics and even admitted that once he was caught at a homeless shelter in Kentucky, originally the arrest was over narcotics, but while they tested DNA, they found the link to his crimes that were left as cold cases. And he actually memorized all of the victims that he had killed. That's crazy. Number one, Raymond Volden Lahare and John Heller. These men are hella messed up and I'm not surprised, but it's also known that, um, yeah, that's pretty much why these guys are on this list. Specifically Raymond, he was a doctor who, re who ran a research study to learn about the effects of syphilis on 400 African American men, also supposedly also 600 African men, around that range. The study began in 1932 and in the 1940s the cure of syphilis was discovered in penicillin. As a result, during the experimentation, the doctors didn't tell the patients they had syphilis and didn't even give them a cure. Even some of the subjects who have heard about penicillin, so the doctors gave them sugar pills and said that they were cured when they weren't. They even prevented 50s era public health campaigns to cure syphilis from an operating in their area and they told patients that the pay Painful spinal taps and other procedures were free treatments. They did not allow patients to see any other doctors just in case those other doctors would cure them and mess up their so called research. Many of the patients were drafted for World War II and the military wanted to cure their syphilis and recruit them, which the researchers fought as best as they were able to, and the study finally ended in 1972. By that time, 128 of the men have died from syphilis and the rest have been treated by military while they were drafted. Many of the children were born with syphilis related birth defects, and more than that, born dead. The last victim of this gross and horrible experiment, also known as the infamous Tuskegee syphilis study, was Ernest Hendon, who died on the 16th of January 2004. According to Fred Gray, a lawyer who represented victims of the study of the federal lawsuit, eventually in the courts as well as the study of the law of the case brought to wild attention of the three that were unethical of the study. Evidently, the rights of the research subjects were violated. The Tuskegee study raised a lot of host of ethical issues such as informed consent, racism, patronism, unfair subject selection in research, maleficence, truth telling, and and justice, among others. The gross part that even though the research helped reduce syphilis, John got an award for it despite the traumatizing things that he had done to the patients for life. Number 10, Dracula. The man, the myth, the legend, Vlad the Impaler. This dude was so down bad, he was the inspiration for Dracula. There's really only one reason why he was so evil, and honestly, it's in his name. Vlad the Impaler liked to impale people, oftentimes alive. As if this was the worst thing thought up by a human being ever, he would leave the pikes on display, creating a horror only the eyes of medieval Europe could see. There's gonna be a lot of bad dudes on this list, some really saucy villains, unsavory characters who will make your skin crawl, but only Vlad has been bad enough to get a monster inspired by him, essentially turning his actions into somewhat of a spooky mythology. Dude gives off some serious goth energy. There's a few portraits of him, but 
If you look at it, he's got this stare in his eyes. Like, like he wants to impale me or something. Vlad be nimble, Vlad be quick, just wait till you see his sharpened sticks. Number nine, the guy everyone knows. Look, YouTube won't let me say his name, but do we really have to? I mean, it's Mustache Man. Infamous for his bad art and lame book, he was the fascist leader of Germany. The very same leader who forced the world into World War II. Remember that one? Yeah. He's the very same monster who organized the destruction of Jewish peoples in Europe, and if he had his way, probably the whole world. I wouldn't be surprised if you showed a picture of him to anyone on Earth, any country, rich or poor, and they will most likely know who that was. That's the kind of evil that will get you talked about in classes all over the world, and likely for a long time. Eventually, he got what was coming to him, and the world had peace and prosperity, and there was never ever another bad, stinky war ever again. Why is he not number one, you might be asking? Well, that's just because his numbers don't compare to others, which is a very troubling statistic. I'll get to that later. Number eight, busy man. Most people on this list are not going to need any introduction. Genghis Khan is no exception to that. The Mongol warrior king saw his nomadic empire stretch thousands of miles, being one of history's largest empires. If you've been paying attention in history class, and you should have been, don't skip class or Big Ched will put you in the naughty corner. But yes, that's right, I just referred to myself in the third person. Speaking of third person, that's how many people Genghis unalived in his bloody conquests. Oh, did I say three? I actually meant a lot. Did I say a lot? I actually meant a disturbing amount. Some people like to point out that he was accepting of other people's cultures and beliefs. Yes, that is true, but that's after he burned down the village right before he got to yours, and you got forcibly assimilated into his numbers. As you can also imagine, a bloodthirsty barbarian like him did not treat women with much respect. It's Kangas Khan, man. That's, that's just how it do be. Number seven, so long, Bowser. Ivan the Terrible. Okay, sure, Vlad was called the Impaler, but you can kind of take that in a different way, right? Not in that way. All innuendos aside, with a name like Ivan the Terrible, it's kind of hard to work around that. Even as a child, Ivan was showing traits of an evil dictator, or supervillain really, as it's said that he would throw animals off of tall roofs in the same way that Mario throws Bowser off of platforms. Becoming the first Tsar of Russia, and probably its worst, he's responsible for many horrors and crimes, but the most infamous being his responsibility for his own son's demise. After a heated argument regarding his unborn grandson, and in a binding fit of rage, Ivan claimed his son's life. Sure, dads get angry when sons don't help mow the lawns or help take out the trash, but that's going a little far. One minute you're having a fight with your dad, and the next minute you're being carried out by Ghani and pallbearers. You know, the dancing guys, the memes, the casket, you know? Yeah, it's a joke. Number six, the mad doctor. I love doctors. Shout out to the people working in the medical field right now. I appreciate you. I couldn't even imagine the horror that is medical school, though. We all know my track record for reading, and hours upon hours of studying would just be bad for my health. I gotta squeeze more video game time in there. It's just how I work, man. However, one doctor I would not want to cross is Dr. Henry Howard Holmes. He is most likely the inspiration for a lot of horror movies. A serial unaliver said to have been performing surgeries on animals at a young age. Which, again, doing some freaky deaky stuff to animals as a kid is like the red flag of red flags. It's like the only red flag. If that wasn't enough, he used to steal cadavers from the university he was studying at and, and doing all kinds of not nice things to them, not naughty, bad. Having a clear obsession with medical practices and anatomy probably was helpful in disposing of his victims. And like something from Tales of the Crypt Keeper, that's exactly what he did. He constructed a large house, or building really, with trap doors, secret tunnels, and a lot of rooms. A basement where he could dispose of his victims. He would later then open this house of horrors up as a hotel where unknowing people would come to meet their doom. Yes, it's Tales of the Crypt Keeper. <laughs> come check in to the Hotel of Doom. Number five. Bad comrade. Stosif Jolin was the leader of the Soviet Union for probably too long. A man who worked his way up the political chain until general secretary meant leader, which if you look it up, it's kind of crazy. That itself is a crazy story. He's responsible for a great loss of life. It is estimated in the range of 40 million people. Ooh, yikes. Most spooky evil dudes usually go after an enemy, 
to someone they considered to not be part of them. He did do this, but a lot of his own people sadly met their ends from the Red Menace too. Organized and deliberate purges of people and famines to starve people. It's safe to say he is and was and always will be one of the worst humans to ever walk the face of the earth. To put it in perspective, Jolin's son was a soldier in World War II, and after being captured by German forces, the Germans thought they had one on the bus. Heck, this was a get out of jail free card, right? Well, when a prisoner trade was proposed by the Germans, Jolin laughed at only how an evil communist could, and denied the trade. His son would later perish in a POW camp shortly after. What a monster. You think you trade with me? Ah, keep them, I don't want. Number 4. Fine White Powder Oh to be in Miami in the mid 1980s. If I had one wish, it would be to spend a summer night in the neon soaked beaches of Miami under strict laws enforced by a president who didn't know what was going on right underneath his nose. If you were around back then, then you probably got to experience something like that. Or at least in my fever dreams. I hope so. But as much as I'd like to be Tony Montana with all that sugar on his desk, I know it's bad for my health. Speaking of bad for your health, Pablo Escobar. I know, that's where I went with that. Probably the most ruthless criminal ever to live on planet Earth. Pablo was a poor man born in a poor country, but ended up being one of, if not the richest man on planet Earth. His lucrative distribution of adult sugar in the 80s made him very wealthy. It also made him very dangerous, as he was willing to do whatever to get his way. Extortion, bribing, bombing, just about anything you can think of. Oh yeah, he was one bad dude. He had so much money that he had to bury it all all over Colombia. Every once in a while some of his buried treasure pops up. And as much as I want a quick million in US cash, I'll just put it back where it came from. Oh Dios mío, lo siento Pablo. Number 3. Al Capone. Another ruthless criminal and honestly, Capone walked so gangsters like Pablo could run. Part of the ruthless Italian mafia that was the outfit, Capone worked his way through the ranks during 1920s Prohibition America, earning millions in his time where really just $100 could stretch a long way. Capone is noted for his violent behavior throughout his life and the many accidents accidents he caused directly or indirectly. Prohibition and the depression were hard times for a lot of folks in America, however the media and the people of Chicago at first always wanted to see what the lavish gangster was up to, as his criminal life became somewhat publicized, most likely due to his wealth, the dude was rich. He eventually would get arrested and sent to Alcatraz, which was probably the worst prison in America or the best Call of Duty Zombies map depending on how you look at things. I look at things through a Call of Duty way, so eh. Number 2. Gavrila Princip That might not be a name that you're familiar with, but it was the man who unalived Franz Ferdinand, which started World War I, which caused World War II, which caused the Cold War, which caused the collapse of Soviet Russia, and it's why you live in a post-war globalist world with markets developing rapidly in the cyber world. Except maybe the whole thing in Ukraine, watch out for that. Kind of crazy to think how all that could come from one wrong turn and a guy seizing an opportunity, but this also means he's kind of responsible in a way for all the bad stuff that happened in those times as well. So maybe don't seize the day? I'm not sure. Just, just don't be ruthless criminals, guys. Watch our videos instead. Although I could blame them for failing my math test in high school. Yeah, we'll go with that. Number one, Mao Zedong. I'd like to come out here and tell you all about the chairman of China, but that simply is just too hot for TV, and if it's too hot for TV, it's too hot for YouTube. Basically, he was the dictator of communist China and is responsible for many lives lost. It's estimated to be somewhere in the range of 60 to 80 million people. Whoa. <laughs> Dude was down bad, the definition of down bad, and although many were told to adore him, there's still a great many people who remember the terrible things he's done. From Beijing to Hong Kong, there's not a person around who doesn't know who he is. If being a no good rotten person was an Olympic sport, he would have gold medals coming out of his ears. Number 10, Julia Tofana. In the 1600s, women who were left under the control of malignant husbands, who would physically end harm and control them, was a rather common issue. And the general rule was that unless your spouse passed away, that was the only time a woman could be granted her freedom. The active contents inside the vial with the artwork of St. Nicholas were unknown, but mostly it was filled with arsenic, lead, and possibly belladonna. It was colorless, tasteless, and therefore easy to mix with 
with other many other substances like wine or water. It was called by the name Aqua Tofana, and it was named after the suspected Julia Tofana as she was the main distributor and ringleader of this secret sauce. The actual creator might have actually been another woman who was caught later on. The poisoning of Aqua Tofana would go unnoticed as its symptoms would mimic other illnesses that were prominent at the time. First dosage would mimic a cold, the third dosage digestive issues, and the fourth was death. It was so effective and helpful that when the poison was used in a slow active state, it would give the victims the assumption that they were dying and would write a will and repent. And if the provider of the poison changed their mind, the antidote was simply lemon juice and vinegar. Although the invention of this poison substance was eventually discontinued as so many had been caught with the subject, it lasted for the length that it did due to the assumption that it was a cosmetic, when really it was for women of this time a vial of liberation and freedom. Number 9. Vladimir Demikhov A very famous Soviet scientist by the name of Vladimir Demikhov was known for his innovation, organ transplants, which had saved many lives in the medical world by extending life from near-death events. However, how he came to this is just as disturbing and concerning as it was revolutionary and innovative, and he would transplant a number of vital organs between dogs. But then he decided to experiment even further by suing together a two-headed dog. He and his assistants would attempt to operate not just a few times, but over 24 times to create a functioning two-headed dog, and it was at the 24th time it was widely publicized. It was even featured on Life magazine and unsurprisingly was considered a very dark, horrifying creation that had been beheld. He sewed together the head of a neck of a small dog named Shavka onto the neck of a large stray German Shepherd named Broad Yaga. The mad scientist created an unnatural creation at a disturbing cost. For the surgery itself, Demikhov amputated Shavka the lower body below the four legs, keeping her heart and lungs connected until just before the transplant. Then he could attach Shavka to the upper body of a corresponding incision of Brodiaga's neck. The operation lasted three and a half hours, although both could function, and here Shavka ended up dying as she was not attached to Brodiaga's stomach, so whatever she ate fell out. And tragically, the two animals died four days later due to the damage of a crucial vein. The previous pair of dogs lasted for a month before they too died in a fatal end, and Vladimir also had no intention to stop his animal cruelty experiments and would continue trying until his death. Number 8, MK Ultra. Project MK Ultra was an illegal human experimentation program designed and undertaken by the CIA and intended to develop procedures and identifying drugs that could be used during interrogations to weaken people and force confessions through brainwashing and psychological torture. MK Ultra used numerous methods to manipulate its subjects' mental state and brain functions, such as a covert administration of high doses of psychoactive drugs and other chemicals without the subject's consent, electric shocks, hypnosis, sensory deprivation, isolation, verbal, and etc and other forms of torment. MK Ultra was preceded by Project Artichoke and it was organized through the CIA's office and coordinated with the US Army's biological warfare labs. The program engaged in illegal activities including the use of US and Canadian citizens as unwitting test subjects. Investigative efforts were hampered by CIA director Richard Helms' order that all MK Ultra files be destroyed in 1973. The Church Committee and Rockefeller Commission's investigations relied on the sworn testimony of direct participants and on the small number of documents that survived Helms' order. In 1977 a Freedom of Information Act requested uncovered a cache of 20,000 documents relating to MK Ultra, which led to Senate hearings. But some of the surviving information about MK Ultra was declassified in 2001. Number 7, Philip Zimbardo. An American psychologist and a professor at Stanford University was known for his involvement, leadership, and administration on the research of the Stanford Prison Experiment. He was heavily criticized as the experiment was seen unethical and scientific reasons. The Stanford Prison Experiment was a psychological experiment conducted to stimulate a prison environment to examine the effects of situational variables on participants' reaction and behaviors. Participants were recruited from the local community with an ad in the newspaper offering $15 per day to male students who wanted to participate in a psychological study of prison life. Keep in mind, $15 back then is roughly $114 today. Volunteers were chosen after assessments of psychological stability and then randomly assigned to being prisoners or prison guards. Over the following five days, psychological harm of the prisoners by the guards became increasingly brutal. After psychologist Christina Maslach visited to evaluate the conditions, she was upset to see how study participants were behaving and she confronted Zimbardo and he ended the experiments on the sixth day. The SBE had been referenced and heavily criticized as an example of an unethical psychological experiment as a hardum inflict on the participants in this and the other experiments in the post-World War II era. Because of this experiment, it prompted American universities to improve their ethical requirements and institutional review on human experiments to prevent them from being similarly harmed. The goal of Zimbardo's primary reason for the conduct 
conducting of the experiment was a focus on the power of roles, rules, symbols, group identity, and situational validation of behavior that generally would repulse ordinary individuals. But with one positive result of the study is that it altered the way the US prisons are run. For example, juveniles accused of federal crimes are no longer housed with before trial with adult prisoners due to the risk of violence against them. Number 6. Phalaris and Perlios of Athens Throughout history, humans in general have created an enclave of many extraordinary things. And as civilizations go, for some reason in our distant past, they had an obsession of creating agonizing means and the inflictions of others. Perlios of Athens had created something that at first glance may seem like a work of art, but its uses had been a thing of torment, the brazen bull. The beautiful bronze statue casted in ancient Greece was invented between 570 and 554 BC. The statue was actually commissioned by the reign of Phalaris, an evil tyrant in Sicily. So many would think that he's actually the real inventor inventor or more or less had the idea. This tyrant was also known for eating new babies as his new cruel torment device and the bull was cast hollow and was used as a fire would be built below and its design was that it would be opened and a person would be forced inside. The fire would start underneath the person and it would burn as the smoke and steam would escape from the bull's nose. Incense was placed inside to counteract the smell of burnt flesh and it is said that it was a series of tubes built inside the statue to design to distort the screams of the victim and make them sound like an animal. Phalaris was a piece of work as he wanted to test the sound system of the bull that he even pushed Perlios, the man who created the bull for him, into the belly and lit a fire under him. And then he later released him before he pushed him off a cliff. But by sheer karma, Phalaris died in a bull himself as the city was taken over by Telemachus in 554 BC. Number 5. Lytle S. Adams After hearing about the vicious attacks of Pearl Harbor on the radio, Lytle S. Adams developed a unique plan of vengeance against the Japanese Imperial Army with the Bat Bomb. The bomb consisted a bomb-shaped casting over a thousand compartments, each containing a hibernating Mexican free-tailed bat with a small timed incendiary bomb attached. Dropped from a bomber at dawn, the castings would deploy a parachute in mid-flight and open a release of bats, which would then disperse the eaves and attics in a 20-40 mile radius. Adams stated that the bat was the lowest form of animal life and that until now, reasons for its creations have remained unexplained. He went on to espouse that bats were created by God to wait this hour to play their part in the scheme of free human existence to frustrate any attempt of those who dared desecrate our way of this life. This weird device was then of course proved by President Roosevelt, who's remarked that his friend wasn't crazy, but the idea was worth looking into. Either way, after the conducted of a few tests, the program was eventually cancelled after it was estimated a use of 2 million or in today's value 32 million dollars was wasted on this invention. When it comes to war, humans showcase the worst of the worst if it means of expanding their nation's political planning. And if you're in the military, there's an internal conflict to fill in your nationalism and your internal duty to serve the country and you forget your economical issues. When it comes to the invention of war, as it has been showcased throughout history time and time again, even in current unfortunate events, the creation led to genocide by means of invention of different kinds of warfare. Developed by Fritz Harber, who was a professor at the the University of Karlsruhe was a brilliant chemist who invented the industrial scale productions of ammonia based fertilizer. Alongside Frederick Guthrie, the two was noted as the ones who weaponized and synthesized a Vescant chemical warfare agent called mustard gas, a widely used weapon used during World War I by both sides of the conflict with particularly harmful and deadly effects. It was responsible for the 1,205,655 non fatal casualties and 91,198 deaths. The effects range from minor symptoms such as skin irritation and conjunctivitis to severe lung damage when inhaled. Despite the horrific use of mustard gas during World War I, there was a silver lining, the discovery of the first modern chemotherapeutic agent based on observations of World War I survivors exposed to mustard gas. The studies eventually launched an era of cancer chemotherapy research. Number 3. Oliver Winchester An American businessman and politician named Oliver Winchester was best known for his founding manufacturing the marketing of the Winchester Repeating Arms Company, aka the Winchester Rifle. The first official Winchester rifle was a model in 1866. Repeating rifles was not widely used until after the war when they became increasingly popular with the civilians. Military authorities concentrated primarily on perfecting breech-loading single-shot rifles for many more years. His ownership was then passed to his son, who died of TB, and his wife Sarah Winchester ended up moving to California with the inheritance as she began to make the famed Winchester House, a haunted mystery house due to her fear of spirits being murdered by the rifle. Number 2. Dow and Company Originally developed to simply enhance the growth of soybeans, Agent Orange was weaponized and used extensively during the Vietnam War. During the war, Dow, Monsanto, and other companies were compelled by the US government to produce Agent Orange under the US Defense Production Act of 1950. Used in large quantities, it was a powerful herbicide used by the United States to deforest the jungles and destroy Viet Cong and North Vietnamese army crops. The United States military sprayed upon up to 20 million 
gallons of herbicides over Laos, Vietnam, and Cambodia from 1961 through 1971, covering over 4.5 million acres. Agent Orange was often proven afterwards to cause very serious health problems for both Vietnamese people and returning U.S. military personnel and their families. Among were rashes, birth defects, and severe neurological problems, as well as cancer. This military action has caused the nation of Vietnam since then. The country has reported over 400,000 of their people were maimed and killed by the harm of the herbicides that 500,000 of their children have been born with birth defects caused by the exposure of Agent Orange. The U.S. courts, of course, have constantly ruled that Dow and other manufacturers bear no responsibility for the development and the use of Agent Orange during the Vietnam War and have dismissed all legal claims to the contrary. And finally, number one, Oppenheimer. An American theoretical physicist and director of the Manhattan Project Los Alamos Laboratory during World War II is often called the father of the atomic bomb, causing the destruction and devastation of the Japanese as it resulted the tragedies of 200,000 civilians and military personnel. The ethics of these bombings and the roles in Japan's surrender are subjects of debate. Oppenheimer did important research of the theoretical astronomy as well as the quantum field theory and the extensive of quantum electric dynamics. But with his interests that led him to the development of these weapons still hold to this day dire consequences on the lives that it would affect. In a very famous quote to his recognition, he has said, if the radiance of a thousand suns were to burst at once in the sky, that would be like the splendor of the mighty one. Now I have become death, the shatter of worlds. In a meeting he had with President Truman, he was distraught at the invention as it was now readily usable at the hands of practically anyone. And President Truman was infuriated at Oppenheimer when he said, Mr. President, I feel I have blood on my hands. Responding that he, Truman, bore sole responsibility for the decision on the atomic bomb against the Japanese, which later Truman said, I don't want to see that son of a bee in this office ever again. The Treaty of the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons aimed to reduce the spread of nuclear weapons, but its effectiveness has been questioned. Modernization of weapons continue to this day. Bombs alike have been proved with its massive casualties and results to the devastation, eradication, genocide of innocent people, and the tragedy of wars it inhibits in our modern times. Number 10, Stubbins Firth. Stubbins Firth was a University of Pennsylvania researcher fixated on one particular scientific scheme and a various dangerous one at that. As a trainee doctor, he became obsessed with the idea that yellow fever was non-contagious, to the extent that he went to great extremes trying to prove it. Armed only with a trusty blade and his insensate desire to find the truth, first sliced, opened his arms, and smeared vomit from yellow fever patients into his wounds. When that made no difference, he poured the vomit into his eyes, drank some of it, fried the stuff, and breathed in the fumes. And in a final act of madness, he covered himself with blood, urine, and saliva from infected patients. Ultimately, Firth proved this theory so far as he didn't get sick. However, we now know that this was as much down to him making samples from the late stage patients who were past the point of contagion. In other words, Firth swallowed infected vomit but didn't shred much new light on the disease. So he did all that. For nothing. Number 9, Jose Delgado. University of Madrid graduate Jose Delgado may have received a prestigious professorship at Yale University, but his research was on dealing with mind control. While at Yale in the 50s, 60s, Delgado inserted electrode implants into the brains of primates and used a remote control that gave off radio frequencies to make the animals perform complicated movements. Later, he placed the implants into the brain of a bull and got into the ring with the beast using his transmitter to stop charging before it reached him. Aside the animal cruelty, he even tried these experiments on 25 people and wired them up. Behaviorally, it only induced the people's anger and impacted more towards their aggression, but he kept striving for a way to achieve mind control and even once said, we must electronically control the brain and someday armies and generals will be controlled by electric stimulation of the brain. I don't know, I guess it doesn't work. Number 8, Paracelsus. Switzerland Paracelsus' contributions to taxology were based heavily in astrology and he is quite no well known for offering the community a wide array of useful ideas and innovations. He was a pioneer in several aspects of the medical revolutions of the Renaissance, emphasizing the value of observation in combination with received wisdom. However, for all of his use, he also thought he might be able to create a homunculi, or small humans, who stood no more than a foot or so height and performed actions very similar to Gollum. Not Gollum from Lord of the Rings, but pretty close. He is said to have run away after turning on their master. The homunculus creation used bits of people using semen and hair. To him, the fully grown homunculi was supposedly greatly skilled in art and could create giants, dwarves, and other marvels as though they are art they are born and therefore art is embodied and inborn in them and they needed to learn it from, well, no one. Well, it didn't end up working because they ended up dying uh, right away. Number seven, Peter Nobor. Clinical psychologists led by Peter Nobor ran a secret experiment in which they separated twins and triplets from each other and adopted them out as singlets. The experiment, said to have been partly funded by the National Institute of Mental Health, came into light when three identical triplet brothers accidentally found each other in 1980. They had no idea they had siblings, and David Kelman, one of the triplets, felt really angry towards the experiment, quoting, we were robbed of 20 years together, said Kelman in the Orlando Sentinel article. His brother, Edward Gallen, sadly took his own life in 1995 at his home. The child psychiatrist who headed up the study, Peter Nober and Viola Bernard, showed no remorse according to news reports, going as far as saying they thought that they were doing something 
wasn't good for the kids, separating them so that they could develop their own individual personalities. As for what Norbert learned from his evil experiment, that anyone's guests, as a result of the controversial study, are being stored in an archive at Yale University, and they say they can't actually reveal it until 2066. Number six, the Burke and Hare. Body snatching was very common in the ages of the pre 19th century, as the only legal way to get bodies for dissection was those of executed criminals. Since it was difficult to get on the waiting list for these bodies, anatomists took burying bodies from the grave, robbers, or even doing it themselves. Up until the students and the anatomists would carry out their own raids in graveyards, acquiring cadavers as and what they could, William Hare and his friends William Burke found ways of delivering fresh corpses to their boarding houses without actually having to steal a body, which is that they would smother more than a dozen lodgers at that boarding house. And then they would sell their bodies to the anatomist Robert Knox. And Knox didn't notice or care that the bodies that he received were recently fresh, as it was imperative to his job. Burke was later charged and died for his crimes, and the case spurred the British government to loosen the restrictions on dissection. The scandal led to the Anatomy Act of 1832, where they made a great number of cadavers legally available for education purposes. Typically, these bodies would be from those who died in an asylum and had no relatives or any ways to cover for funeral costs. Number five, Sidney Gottlieb. Gottlieb was in charge of the CIA's MK Ultra project in the 1950s. This project's goal was to investigate techniques that would crush the human psyche to the point that it would admit to anything. I guess in some ways it's kind of like the truth serum, but with psychology. More specifically, he too also wanted to find a way to do mind control like Delgado in number nine. He wanted to find ways with the CIA to induce the behaviors of enemies, but in these cases, Sidney went his way to buy dosing unsuspecting subjects with LSD, experimenting with illegal drugs, and sought out all sorts of exciting ways to poison people, including Fidel Castro, as he is the man behind the infamous poison cigar. If you guys know Stranger Things, the suspicion of Eleven getting her powers was from her mom being induced with LSD chemicals that were thought to be creating of powerful abilities, but unlike Stranger Things, it definitely helped open someone's mind up, but not like moving stuff with one's mind. Number four, Sergei Berko Honeko. Although he's been credited with helping bring about the most important advances with open heart surgery, his gruesome act was that on experimentations on animals, also animal cruelty. Sergei wasn't content with slicing up animals after they died, more specifically not only did he not like to wait, but he also didn't like the animals to die, even after they've been decapitated. In the late 1930s, him and his team undertook a series of experiments as part of which they removed a canine's head and kept it alive away from its body by hooking it up to an air and blood supply apparatus. He would also have another hound had all the blood drawn from its body, only later to be brought back to life by the Soviet Frankenstein. Number three, Shiro Ishii, a microbiologist and a lieutenant general of Unit 731, a biological warfare unit of the Imperial Japanese Army during the Second Sino-Japanese War. Ishii is remembered as the father of biological warfare. Under his watch, thousands of captives were infected with deadly diseases and thousands more were impacted by chemicals on the battlefield. Ishii performed a bunch of experiments that had nothing to do with chemical warfare, including force of actions, vivisections, and simulated strokes. Huh. Humans were also used as a living test cases for grenades and flamethrowers, and prisoners were injected with inoculations of diseases disguised as vaccinations to study their effects. Because life is totally fair, Ishii was never charged with war crimes, and he died peacefully at his home in Japan in the late 60s. Number two, Joseph Mengele. Mengele gained notoriety chiefly for being one of the SS physicians who supervised the selections of arriving transports of prisoners, determining who was to be killed and who was to become a forced laborer, and for performing human experiments on camp inmates, amongst whom Mengele was known as the Angel of Death. Mengele was just a stone cold killer as he performed experiments on 3,000 sets of twins and less than 30 survived his depraved antics. His experiments included, but sadly were not limited to, dyeing children's eyes to be a specific color since he has an obsession with monochromatic eyes, sewing twins together to make them conjoined, and giving them gangrene. In fact, many of his evil deeds weren't scientific at all. He was just masochistic. He was reportedly smiling every time he took part of his selection process of sending arrivals at camps on who were unfit for labor straight to the gas chambers. He died in 1976 and as he was never brought to justice for his crimes. Number one, J. Marion Sims. Although he was known as the father of modern gynecology, Sims was gained much for his fame for doing experimental surgeries on slave women. Sims remained a controversial figure to this day because the condition he was treating the women, visco genital fistula, caused terrible suffering. Women with fistulas, a tear between their private parts and their bladder, were incontent and were often rejected by society. Sims performed the surgery without anesthesia, in part because anesthesia had only recently been discovered, and in part because Sims believed that operations were not painful enough to justify the trouble, which is what he said, but still regardless, the cruelty he bestowed on these women were not at all consented, and manipulated the social institutions on slavery to perform human experiments, which by any standards is unacceptable. Number 10, Pearl Hart. Pearl Hart was a notorious figure in the American Wild West, known for involvement in a stagecoach robbery. Her life story is often intertwined with the tales of the Old West and the outlaws who sought adventure and fortune during that era. Pearl Hart, whose real name was Pearl Taylor, was born in Canada in 1871, but was later moved to the United States 
States and became involved in various activities, including acting and singing. In 1899, Pearl Hart and a companion, Joe Boot, decided to rob a stagecoach in Arizona. The stagecoach was an en route from the Globe to Florence, carrying passengers and valuables. The stagecoach robbery did not go as planned, as Pearl Hart and Joe Boot were not experienced criminals, and their attempt was somewhat amateurish. They failed to obtain a significant amount of loot, and after the failed robbery, Pearl and Joe was captured by law enforcement. They were then later arrested and brought to trial, and Pearl Hart and Joe Boot were tried for their crimes. During the trial, Pearl presented herself as a victim of circumstances, arguing that she had committed the robbery due to personal circumstances. She was convicted and sentenced to only five years in prison. As for Joe, nobody knows. Pearl's Hart's life after her release from prison remains somewhat of a mystery. After serving about two years of her sentence, she was released due to good behavior, and Pearl Hart's belief was dramatic stint as a stagecoat robber contributed to her lasting notoriety as the annals of Wild West history. Her story became a part of a lore surrounding outlaws and characteristics of American frontier. Number nine, Laura Bullion was also known as the Rose of the Wild Bunch. She was a female outlaw associated with the Wild Bunch Gang, a notorious group of American outlaws led by Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid during the late 19th and early 20th century. Laura Bullion was born in Knickerbocker, Texas in 1876. Her family moved to the mining town of Moab, Utah, where she grew up. Laura became acquainted with the members of the Wild Bunch, including Butch Cassidy, the Sundance Kid, and then other notorious outlaws. She developed a romantic relationship with Kid Curry, a member of the gang, and Laura Bullion participated in various criminal activities with the Wild Bunch, including train and bank robberies. She was also known for her sharp shooting skills and her involvement in the gang's illegal enterprises. In 1901, Laura was arrested in St. Louis, Missouri for her involvement in a train robbery. She was sentenced to five years in prison, but only served about three, and after her release from prison, Laura Bullion tried to lead a more law-binding life. She lived under an assumed name in Memphis, Tennessee, working as a housekeeper. Laura Bullion then passed away on December 2nd, 1961 in Memphis, Tennessee, at the age of 85, and her death was largely unnoticed by the public. Number eight, there is a limited historical information about Belle Sidions, who is also known as Madame Vestal. She was a figure associated with the American Old West during the late 19th century, particularly in the realms of entertainment and the infamous red light districts of frontier towns. Belle Sidions was reportedly an entertainer and an actress who performed in various theatrical productions and shows during the late 1800s. But later in her life, Belle Sidions adopted the alias Madame Vestals and became known for her role as Madame, managing establishments and red light districts. These areas were known for housing brothels and establishments that provided various forms of entertainment. During the late 19th century, the American West would experience rapid growth with numerous people seeking fortune and adventures in newly settled areas, as well as red light districts. The presence of the red light districts, saloons, and entertainment venues catered to the needs of this transient population that was very common. Like many individuals associated with the red light districts of the Old West, the details of Belle Sidian's life remain somewhat elusive and separating the fact that a legend can be challenging. Nevertheless, figures like Madame Vestals contribute to the colorful and diverse tapestry of the Old West societal history. Number seven, Rose Dunn, also known as the Rose of the Cameron, was a legendary figure associated with the American Old West. Born in 1878, Rose Dunn gained notoriety for her romantic entanglements with outlaws and her involvement in the activities of the Wild Bunch Gang. Hmm. Rose Dunn was also born in Indian Territory, which later became Oklahoma in 1878. She came from a large family, and her brothers were also known for their involvement in outlaw activities. Rose Dunn then became romantically involved with George Bitter Creek Newcomb, a member of the Wild Bunch Gang led by Bill Doolin. The Wild Bunch was notorious for his involvement in train and bank robberies, as we know. In 1895, a shootout occurred in the Dunn family ranch involving lawmen seeking to capture Dunn brothers and their associates. During the confrontation, Rose's brother John Dunn was killed, and her older brother George Dunn was captured after the death of Bitter Creek Newcomb. Rose Dunn then lived more of a settled life, and she married Charles Albert Noble, a farmer, and they had a family. Rose and Charles lived in Catheridge, Missouri. Rose Dunn then passed away on February 5th, 1955, in Parachute, Colorado. Number six, Sarah Jane Newman was born in Tennessee in 1817 and later moved to Texas. Also known as Sally Skull or Sally Skull, was a figure associated with the Texas frontier during the mid 19th century. Her life story involves elements of violence, crime, and romance, contributing to her notoriety in the history of the American West. Sarah married George Washington Skull, a Texan and a participant in the Texan War of Independence. George Skull operated a ferry and owned a ranch in a location known as Skull Crossing in the San Antonio River. The crossing was an important point for travelers and cattle drives as the Skull family became involved in violent feuds with the Taylor family over land and cattle. This feud escalated and resulted in several killings on both sides. With also casualties in 1867 during the height of the feud, Scally Skull was widowed after her husband George Skull was killed. Following his death, she sought out revenge and killed several members of the Taylor family. And after the killing, Sally Skull was captured and imprisoned. She was definitely tried for the deaths, but was charged were dropped due to insufficient evidence. And after her release, Sally Skull's life became less eventful as she lived in relatively obscurity and passed away in 1888. Number five, Mary Catherine Horony, also known as Big Nose Kate, was a historical figure associated with the American Old West as she was a Hungarian-born adult worker and companion to the legendary lawman 
and gambler Doc Holliday. Kate eventually moved to West and found herself in a rough and often lawless mining towns of the Old West as she worked as the Lady of the Night, gained notoriety for her feisty and independence personality. Kate then became romantically involved with John Henry Doc Holliday, a dentist turned gambler and gunfighter. What a career change. They met in Fort Griffin, Texas in 1870s following Doc Holliday's death in 1887. Kate Haruni then lived in various places including Arizona and Colorado. She then worked as a nurse and a hotel owner in the early 1900s and Kate moved to Arizona and lived in poverty. She worked in various jobs including serving as a cook and then in 1930s she applied and for received a pension for being a widow of a veteran American Indian war. Doc Holliday had happened to serve as a scout. Big Nose Kate then passed away on November 2nd, 1940 in Arizona at the age of 90 and she outlived many of the famous figures of the Old West. Number 4 Bell Star Born Myra Maybell Shirley, Bell Star was a notorious figure associated with the American Wild West during the 19th century. She became known as the Bandit Queen and gained notoriety for her associations with various outlaws and her involvement in criminal activities. Bell married several times with her famous marriage being the outlaw Cole Younger, a former member of the James Younger gang. After Younger, she then married Sam Starr, a Cherokee outlaw, which contributed to her connection with the Indian Territory present day Oklahoma. Bell Starr was also known to associate with herself with various outlaws including Jesse James, the Younger Brothers, and the infamous Dalton Gang. Her connections to these outlaws and her involvements in horse theft and other legal activities contributed to her reputation. Bell Starr and her husband Sam Starr lived in the Indian Territory where they ran a horse ranch and their ranch became a haven for outlaws seeking refuge from the law. Bell Starr was arrested several times for various offenses including horse theft. However, she often managed to avoid lengthy imprisonments and her criminal activities continued. Bell Starr's life came to a violent end when she was shot and killed on February 3rd in 1889 while riding home from a neighbor's house. The circumstances of her death remains somewhat of a mystery and the identity of the killer was never actually established. Bell Starr's life exploits became part of the Wild West folklore and over the years, she had been portrayed in many books, films, and television shows contributing to her enduring legend. Number 3 Etta Place Etta Place is one of the mysteries of the American Wild West as her true identity and details of her life pretty much remains uncertain. She was associated with the famous outlaws Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid as we also know them and is often considered to have been romantically involved with the Sundance Kid. Despite her connections to these historical figures, she is very little known about Etta as Etta's place true identity and background are unclear. Her real name and place of birth and details about her early life are not actually known at all and some historical sources suggest that she may have been born in the United States while others propose that she could have just been European or South American origin. Etta Place is also best known for her association with Butch Cassidy uh, aka Robert Leroy Parker and the Sundance Kid whose actual name is Harry Alonzo Longabo and she traveled with them during their exploits in South America where they sought refuge to escape law enforcement in the United States. In the early 20th century Butch Cassidy, the Sundance Kids and Etta traveled to the South America where they continued to life of crime and they are believed to have engaged in bank and train robberies in countries like Argentina and Bolivia. The fate of Etta Place is uncertain as some theories suggest that she may have perished alongside Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid in a shootout with the Bolivian authorities. However, there is actually no conclusive evidence to support this theory as there may be other theories that Etta Place's true identity with some speculating that she may have had used multiple names during her lifetime. However, concrete evidence to confirm her background or provide clarity on her true identity is still undiscovered. Number 2 Born in France around 1829, Eleanor Dumont moved from the United States and became involved with the gambling industry known as the Gold Rush. She arrived in California during the Gold Rush of 1850, seeking opportunities in the Burgeon mining towns in 1854. Eleanor ended up opening a gambling establishment in Nevada City, California, where she ran gambling tables and her reputation for her skills as a car dealer. She then became known as Madame Moustache due to the fact that she had distinctive facial hair and refused to remove it despite societal expectations. And over the years, Madame Moustache opened and managed several gambling establishments in various mining towns including Virginia City and Bodie. Despite her success in the gambling business, Eleanor faced financial challenges and struggled to maintain her enterprises. She suffered major losses and debts that ended up leading to her to a decline in her fortunes. And then Eleanor Dumont's life took a tragic turn and as in 1879, facing financial difficulties and heartbreak, she took her own life by ingesting an overdose of really intense drugs in Bodie, California. Eleanor Dumont's story proves that a glimpse into the complexities of life during the gold rush and the challenges faced by women trying to make a living in a male-dominated society. Her role as a successful gambler and car dealer as well as her refusal to conform to traditional gender norms, contribute to her place in the history of the American West. The nickname Madame Moustache and her distinctive facial features further add the colorful and unconventional aspects of her life. And finally, number one, Bonnie Parker was one half of the notorious criminal duo known as Bonnie and Clyde. Alongside Clyde Barrow, Bonnie Parker gained notoriety during the Great Depression for a series of bank robberies and criminal activities in the early 1930s. Bonnie Elizabeth Parker was born on October 1st, 1910 in Rowena, Texas, and she grew up in a working class family and despite her small stature, developed a love for poetry and drama. Mm, I wonder if that's what caused her to join Clyde. Because she joined Clyde Barrow in January 1930. Clyde was already a seasoned criminal. A little bit of spice, a little paprika. Was serving time in East End Prison Farm in Texas. A mutual acquaintance smuggled a 
homemade weapon to Clyde and he used it to escape. Bonnie and Clyde embarked on a crime spree that included bank robberies, burglaries, and car thefts. They were involved in several pew pew outs with law enforcement and their criminal exploits attracted significant media attention. Bonnie and Clyde were often a part of a criminal gang that included their other associates such as the Clyde brothers Buck Barrow and his wife Blanche Barrow. The gang engaged in violent confrontations with law enforcement resulting in injuries and fatalities on both sides. Bonnie and Clyde gained additional notoriety due to photographs found by police at one of their hideouts and the images depicted the couple posing with weapons contributing to their image of glamorous and dangerous criminals. Bonnie and Clyde crime spree came to a violent end on May 23rd, 1934 when the law enforcement officers ambushed their car near Benville Parish, Louisiana. The officers fired a barrage of bullets, killing both Bonnie and Clyde instantly. And the story of Bonnie and Clyde has become a part of American folklore. Their criminal exploits and romanticized in the media have been a subject of numerous books, films, and songs. And the 1967 film Bonnie and Clyde starring Warren Beatty and Faye Dunaway further cemented their status as infamous figures. Number 10, Lizzie Borden. It might be too clever to talk about Lizzie Borden as a pun, but I'll ask you guys about that later. <laughs> Sorry. Anyways, Lizzie Borden was an American woman who was tried and then later acquitted for the axe murderers of her father and stepmother in Massachusetts. Lizzie was very religious and would go to church and do church activities, teaching Sunday school, etc., etc. Three years later, after her mother passed away, her father remarried to Abby Gray. Lizzie didn't like Abby that much because she suspected Abby's goal was her father's money, and as tensions grew, even more when Andrew would gift real estate to his new family's wife and their stepmother received a house. The night before the murder, their uncle visited their father to discuss property transfer, which placed more tensions. After the crime was committed, the police turned their attention to Lizzie as she gave conflicting testimonies within the day. And after many, many strange occurrences, like her cleaning her dress and burning it up, saying it was covered in paint, the town's suspicion of her drugging her father to sleep in order to whack him with an axe, overall the evidence was unclear and caused many controversial issues. However, the trial was later pushed away when another axe murderer, similar to her father and her stepmom's case, occurred five days prior. Still, the reputation of Lizzie and her sister's involvement was tarnished, and the suspecting evidence and accounts of that day remains unsolved. Number 9, Elsa Koch. Elsa Koch was a German war criminal who committed atrocities while her husband, Karl Otto Koch, was commanded at the Bolchenwald in World War II. Because of the egregiousness of her alleged allegations and her actions, included that she had selected tattooed prisoners for death in order to fashionably create lampshades and other items from their skin. I don't, these are fake, by the way, they're not real. Her 1947 US military commission court trial at Dachau received worldwide media attention, as did the testimony of survivors who ascribed her sadistic and perverse actions acts of violence to Koch giving rise to her image as her concentration camp murderesses. However, authoritative testimony from numerous witnesses at her post-war trials firmly established that she had made extensive use of slave labor at the camp, had assaulted inmates on several occasions, and had reported inmates to the camp SS for beatings. Beatings that resulted in death on at least one occasion while imprisoned, she experienced delusions and had become convinced that the concentration camp survivors would abuse her in the cell. She then ended up taking her own life in jail while serving time. Number 8, Belle Gunness. With an estimated 48 deaths at her hand, Belle Gunness poisoned, bludgeoned, and decapitated her victims, all so that she could collect and line her pockets with savings and insurance policies. This lonely hearts killer was known as Lady Bluebeard, amongst other names, luring her victims with newspaper advertisements. Gunness then began meeting wealthy men through a lovelorn column. Her suitors were her next victims, each of whom brought cash to her farm and then disappeared forever, including John Moo, Henry Galthart, Olaf, Oli B, Andrew, just to name a few. One of the victim's brothers came suspicious, and Gunness's luck seems to be running out. Her farmhouse burnt to the ground and the smoldering ruins workmen discovered four skeletons, three were identified as her foster young, however the fourth, believed to be Gunness, was unexpectedly missing as its skull. After the fire, her victims were unearthed from their shallow graves around the farm, all told the remains of more than 40 men and miners were exhumed. However, Belle managed to skip out of town before being officially convicted and was never tracked down. Her death has never been confirmed. Number 7, Countess Elizabeth Bathory. I don't know if you've seen the tales of Snow White and how there was this once evil queen who yearned for eternal beauty, but like all fairy tales come from the stem of truth. Countess Elizabeth Bathory was a Hungarian noblewoman who was an alleged serial killer from the family Bathory, who owned a land in the Kingdom of Hungary. Bathory and four of her servants were accused of torturing and killing hundreds of young and old women between 1590 and 1610. During her arrest, it is commonly believed that Bathory was caught in the act of the torture, but the reality was that she was just having dinner. Most of the witnesses testified that she had heard the accusations from others, but did not actually see it themselves. The servants confessed under torture, which is not credible in contemporary proceedings. The accusations of the murder were based on rumors, and as as there is no documents to prove that anyone in the area complained about the Countess, in this time period, if someone was harmed or let's say someone stole something, a letter would be written out as a complaint. 
Several authors have argued that Elizabeth Bathory was a victim of conspiracy. Similar, during the Salem witch trials, many people insisted that they saw the accused witches of flying through the sky. Clearly, neither thing happened and are possibly a form of mass delusion or self interest lies. Historians are therefore extremely careful in how they treat eyewitness accounts of this sort, given the possibility for collective and self reinforcing delusions. Number six, Dorothea Helen Puente. Dorothea Helen Puente was an American convicted serial killer, and in the 1980s, she ran a boarding house in Sacramento, California, and murdered very Various elderly and mentally disabled boarders before cashing their social security checks. She paid each of them monthly spendies, but then kept the remaining for what she claimed were expenses for the boarding house. Puente's boarding house was visited by several parole agents as a result of previous orders for her to stay away from the elderly people and not to handle government checks. Despite these frequent visits, she was never charged with anything. Neighbors began to grow suspicious of Puente when she said that she adopted a homeless man uh, named Chief to serve as a handyman. She had Chief dig the basement and remove soil and garbage from the property, and Chief then put in a newly concrete slab in the basement before he too mysteriously disappeared. In November 1988, another tenant in Puente's house, Alvaro Montoya, disappeared and after he failed to show up for his meetings, his social worker reported him missing. Police arrived at Puente's boarding house and began to search the property. They discovered recently disturbed soil and were able to uncover seven bodies in the yard. When the investigation began, Puente was not considered a suspect and as soon as the police let her out of their sight, she basically fled to Los Angeles where she visited a bar and began to talk to an elderly pen. Engineer. The man recognized her from the news and then he called the police and she was charged with nine counts of murder and was sentenced to two years of life. She died at the age of 82 and had always insisted all of her tenants died to natural death. Number five, Julia Tofana. Not your typical Chanel number five, but this too was a femme fatale bottle used by so many women to do one major thing to get rid of their husbands. By some definitions, Julia was a girl's girl. After all, it was the 1600s, and women who had malignant husbands who would physically harm and control them was a rather common issue, and the general rule was that unless your spouse passed away, that was the only time a woman could be granted her freedom. In its creation was associated by none other than Julia Tofana, who apparently was the ringleader of six poisoners in Rome. In order to avoid detection from authorities, they actually used the trade name after St. Nicholas and would sell the poison openly as a cosmetic. They even went ahead and used an image of St. Nicholas over the vials and St. Nicholas and the vial of poison would be sold affecting over 600 victims, mostly husbands. The active contents inside the vial was unknown but it was filled with arsenic, lead and possibly belladonna. It was colorless, tasteless and therefore very easy to mix with other substances like wine or water. The poisoning would go unnoticed and its symptoms would mimic other illnesses that was prominent at the time. First dosage would mimic a cold, the third would be digestive issues and the fourth was death. It was so effective and helpful that when the poison was used to be in its slow active state, it would give the victims time to assume that they were dying and write a will. And if the provider of the poison changed their mind, an antidote was simply lemon juice and vinegar. Fun fact, Mozart at one point was poisoned using aqua tofana, but apparently he himself started this rumor. And if you knew anything about Mozart, he was the Bugs Bunny level type of troll. Number four, Bonnie Nettles. As cult leaders go, most women of cult leaders were subject to follow their male counterparts. As for Bonnie Nettles, she was the co-founder and co-leader with Marshall Applewhite of the Heaven's Gate New Religion movement. Although she was registered as a nurse and was married to a businessman named Joseph Nettles, she actually lived a relatively normal life. However, according to the New York Times, she began attempting to contact deceased spirits by conducting regular seances and came to believe that the 19th century monk named Brother Francis frequently spoke with her and gave her instructions. She also visited multiple fortune tellers who told her that she would soon meet a mysterious man who was tall with light hair and fair complexion, descriptions that were very close to Marshall Applewhite's appearance. It was unclear how they met, but after Nettles did an astrological reading for Applewhite, they had an instant spiritual connection. Nettles and Applewhite established Heaven's Gate together as equals, with Nettles running the group and Applewhite speaking for her. Nettles claimed to have communicated with aliens about the next level and told Applewhite to tell their followers. When Nettles died from cancer, the mass followers of Heaven's Gates would then follow through by cultivating to take their own lives in 1997. Number three, Eileen Wernos. On a bit recent note, you may or may not have heard in this case in the news, but Eileen Wernos was a convicted serial killer as she targeted only men as an adult worker. She had up to seven victims and would target specifically motorists, men who she would meet as a hitchhiker. Her story begins when her mother at the age of 14 married her father at the age of 19. After two months of having Eileen, her parents divorced and left her with her alcoholic grandparents who were also malicious in their care. Eileen would then do adult work as a minor once her grandfather kicked her out to live in the woods at the age of 15 and she tried to take her own life multiple 
multiple times, all failed attempts, and until she met the love of her life, Tyra Moore, in the late 80s, is when she would continue a string of crime. While she was incarcerated at the Florida Department of Corrections BCI death row for women, she tried to appeal to the US Supreme Court, which was later denied, and at that point, she dismissed her legal counsel and terminated all pending appeals. She would then go off and say, I killed those men, I robbed them cold as ice, and I'd do it again too. There's no chance in keeping me alive or anything, because I'd kill again. I have hate crawling through my system. I'm so sick of this she's crazy stuff. I've been evaluated so many times. I'm competent, sane, and I'm trying to tell the truth. I'm one who seriously hates human life and would kill again. After extreme mistreatments she suffered while imprisoned and the inhumane management given to her by her officers, in her final interview, she turned to the interviewer and said, and also paraphrasing due to censorship, you sabotaged me, society, and the cops and the system. An attacked woman got executed and was used for books and movies and so on. Her final on-camera words were, thanks a lot, society, for railroading my ass. She was later executed by lethal injection. Number two, Pearl Fernandez. Again, although this case is one of a very recent event, it still marks as a notable case in the issues that lie in the legal forms, in the protections of minors, and the lack of involvement of CPS. Pearl Fernandez, you may or may not know, was the mother of Gabriel Fernandez, who passed away in Pearl and her boyfriend Usaro's custody. According to The Atlantic, Pearl Fernandez and her boyfriend shot Gabriel with a BB gun, tortured him with pepper spray, beat him with a baseball bat, and forced him to eat cat feces. All injuries pointed to severe psychological and emotional distress endured over a long period of time. It was not one time event that led to Gabriel's death, it was months of torture. A judge rejected her remorse, stating that Pearl's actions were horrendous and inhumane and nothing short of evil. At her trial, jurors heard how Gabriel was tortured and abused by his mother and her boyfriend after being placed in their care eight months before his death. Pearl is now serving time at the Central California Women's Facility after being sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Number one, Jolly Jane. While she definitely was jolly when she committed these crimes, Jane Toppin, nicknamed Jolly Jane, was an American serial killer who was known to have committed 12 murders in Massachusetts between 18 and 1901. How did she commit these? Well, she was a nurse, and her objective was oddly enough to target patients and their family members. Doctors who hired her thought of her as one of their best nurses, but today psychiatrists say that she was one of the most unusual serial killers in history. She was born and raised in the Boston Female Asylum, where unwanted female children were often abandoned. There she was adopted by Anne Toppin, where she was under foster care until she was 18. At this point, she then pursued nursing at Cambridge Hospital in Boston. It was here where she stated her interest in the patients was ought to be taken care of. She grew emotional attachments to them, and if she really liked them, she would fake their medical documents to force them to stay longer at the hospital. She would then also dose her elderly patients with opium to see how they react with the drugs, and then upping the dosage each time. She would also watch them slowly succumb to their death, and she would also mix different types of poisons with her patients and other drugs to stage a sickness and nurse them back to health. Very similar to the Gypsy Rose Blanchard case where her mother Dee Dee had a mental illness known as Munch Austin syndrome by proxy. This mental health condition is basically where a caregiver makes up or causes an illness or injury in a person under their care, such as the young or the elderly adult, or a person who has a disability. Because vulnerable people are the victims, MSBP is a form of multiple harm cases. Jolly Jane also had a masochistic side, as she would even get into the bed of her patients who were suffering until they died. She wasn't caught until she used a metallic-based poison on a victim, which finally sparked an investigation in a court in 1902. Topan was found guilty, and then she told her attorney that she actually killed more than 100 people, and even got in beds with more of her victims. She was sentenced to stay at an asylum, stayed there until her death. Number 10, the Don Donovan Family Ouija Board. In the eerie case of the Donovan household, we witness the harrowing consequences of uh, dabbling with the supernatural. Patty Donovan's innocent curiosity led her down a treacherous path when she engaged with, yep, a Ouija board, the thing I hate the most, believing she had found a friend and a spirit. As she grew emotionally dependent on this entity, the disturbing incidents began to unfold. The malevolent spirit, once her confidant or boyfriend, turned into a malevolent force, turned into quite the force wreaking havoc on her family. It targeted their vehicles, disassembling engines and puncturing tires, leaving them vulnerable and stranded. The spirit's actions escalated with vandalism around their home and inexplicable damage to their property, even to the point of furniture levitating and rocks raining down on their house. It's kind of baffling that the family didn't connect the dots sooner, seeing as the signs of, you know, chaos became increasingly apparent and obvious. Her dad, Ted Donovan's desperation, led him to seek help from our favorite paranormal investigators, Ed and Lorraine Warren. Upon their arrival, they sensed a pervasive malevolence within the home, and the family's history with the Ouija board was finally revealed. The Warrens, realizing the gravity of the situation, initiated the process for an exorcism, which took a painfully long month to be granted. In the meantime, the entire family endured more torment and destruction at the hands of the malevolent entities. Finally, on May 2nd, the exorcism took place, liberating the family from their demonic ordeal. However, they were left with a substantial financial burden due to the extensive damages inflicted upon their home. Let this be a lesson to you all. Please, please, please leave Ouija boards alone. 
police. Number 9. The Woodruff Family So this incident happened in St. Francisville, Louisiana and in a home built in 1796 by General David Bradford on top of a formal burial ground so um, brace yourselves. Our story begins with a newly married couple, Mr. and Mrs. Clark Woodruff. Mr. Woodruff was a cruel and harmful man and owned numerous slaves, which was the icky norm at the time, and one in particular that he liked to um, punish went by the name of Chloe. Now, Chloe tried to protect herself from the wrongful punishments by listening in on the Woodruff's conversations and modifying her behavior, which Hey, that's brilliant. Sadly though, one day after being caught eavesdropping, Clark had one of Chloe's ears cut off. The painful experience would stay with Chloe and inspire her to make plans for revenge. On the ninth birthday of the Woodruff's daughter, Chloe placed poisonous oleander leaves into the cake, intending to only get the family sick so she could nurse them back to health and, uh, you know, earn a favor with the family. Tragically, the dose was lethal, and it ended up killing the missus and the offspring. Now, while Chloe was punished fatally by the other slaves and her ghost haunts the home, the mirror in the front hall is cursed and has the spirits of Sarah and her two descendants and strapped inside of it. People who look into the mirror ever since have reported feeling a sense of dread that stays with them past their visit, you know, experiencing horrid thoughts and more. Look, I'm on Team Smash the Thing, even though I know that would technically make the world worse. So maybe just stick it in a closet somewhere, because it's just wrecking. Because it's just messing with every other family. Number eight, Annabelle. Am I biased because Annabelle has always been my favorite demonic artifact? Absolutely, I am. Donna and Angie were student nurses and good friends who had decided to room together while in school. And for Donna's 28th birthday, her mom had gifted her a very large Riggedy Ann doll, something she was thrilled about. Hey, personally, I'd react the same way. Let the record know that I'm always down to accept gifts of dolls or plushies. Soon after adopting the precious doll, though, Donna started to notice some weird behavior. She would leave Annabelle on her bed every morning behind her locked bedroom door, seeing her the same way with her arms and legs crossed, and would come home at night to Annabelle having moved rooms and in positions that um, weren't possible. She's described a few instances of the doll kneeling, and speaking from experience, stuffed dolls can't kneel without falling for more than like a few seconds. Donna and Angie then started finding notes left throughout the apartment, written on parchment paper in red pen, two things they um, didn't own. When Donna's boyfriend Lou started criticizing the doll, unexplainable handprints and scratches began appearing on his body. And that's when the girls made the decision to call the priest, who then brought in Ed and Lorraine Warren. They were able to calm down the entity enough to remove it from the home and transport her to the museum, where she resides to this day, but not without a couple of um, chaos events over the years. Number seven, Robert the Evil Doll. Hey, for starters, this doll only looks vaguely human. His nub of a nose looks like a pair of pinholes, and he's covered in brown little nicks, like scars. His eyes are beady and black, and combined with his malevolent and smirk, it's terrifying to look at. Clasped in his lap, he's holding his own toy, a dog with disproportionate eyes and a too big tongue falling out of its mouth. The doll originally belonged to Robert Eugene Otto, an artist described as, well, eccentric. Neighbors of Robert used to hear him having a conversation with the doll, and this continued into his adult years. He brought it everywhere, and talked about it in the first person as if it weren't a doll, which I know, might sound kind of batty but it's the best way to deal with cursed objects. Trust me, I'm talking from experience. The doll remained stored in the Otto family home until Robert passed away in 1974. After his death, a couple bought the house and their eight-year-old found the doll in the attic. The young girl often claimed that the doll was trying to kill her and it's now on display in a museum in Key West and is still believed to curse people. His last caretaker before the museum experienced him disappear and reappear as he pleased, along with hearing footsteps and giggling in the attic. Some claimed Robert's expression changed when anybody badmouthed Otto in his presence. Oh, and um, he's been responsible for a few car crashes, some divorces, and broken bones. So, uh, good Robert, good doll, please. I don't need to be cursed. My life's crazy enough as it is. Number six, another Ouija board incident. The story of Mark and his family's eerie encounter with a cursed Ouija board infested home in Australia is nothing short of a supernatural roller coaster. At first, you know, subtle signs emerged, like their dog's reluctance to enter the house, which was dismissed as, you know, a mere adjustment to the new environment. But, things quickly escalated. Mysterious flooding in the laundry room, shattered light bulbs, and an overwhelming sense of unease in certain areas of the house signaled something far more sinister. The disembodied laughter, shuffling feet, and phantom voices only intensified their torment. Even visiting relatives experienced the unnerving phenomena firsthand. What's truly chilling is the revelation about the previous renter's involvement in seances and a messy divorce, possibly leaving behind a trail of spiritual chaos. You know, possibly. Maybe. Mark's mother's decision to consult a local pastor led to a grim revelation of multiple demonic entities lurking in their home. As the supernatural disturbances grew unbearable, the family decided to take action. The mom's brave confrontation with the paranormal, you know, reading Bible verses aloud, was met with the spirit's fury, resulting in potential poltergeist activity. The climax of this terrifying tale came when the youngest member of the family miraculously survived a fall from an open window. This event was the final straw, prompting them to flee the cursed house without looking back. Once again, not to sound like a broken record. Leave Ouija boards alone. 
please. Number five, a cursed painting. Technically, this item cursed enough households to be a top 10 list of its own, which is a nightmare for my brain. The tale of the crying boy painting is a chilling example of the inexplicable, a bizarre intersection of art and the supernatural that unfolded in the 1970s and 1980s. Bob Smith's childhood fascination with the seemingly, you know, innocent painting turned into a haunting mystery when a kitchen fire devastated his grandmother's house, leaving only the painting unscathed. The eerie connection deepened when Bob later learned that the very same painting had caused similar tragedies in other households. Giovanni Bregolin's series of paintings, of which the crime boy was a part, became notorious. In 1985, the Sun newspaper in the UK published a shocking account of May and Ron Hall, whose home was consumed by fire, with only the cursed painting surviving unharmed. What's truly unsettling is the firefighter's claim that he had witnessed multiple house fires where everything was reduced to ashes except for copies of The Crying Boy. The widespread reports of similar incidents fueled the belief in the painting's curse, leading to a wave of fear and destruction. Ultimately, the sun's bonfire of these paintings marked the end of their popularity, but a few copies still linger, carrying with them the ominous aura of the inexplicable. So um, if you have one, Burn it. Number four, a conjuring book. In this perplexing case, the Foster family found themselves entangled with quite the evil artifact. Yep a book to conjure evil things that, uh, if you haven't guessed it already, brought malevolent forces into their home. The eerie events began when Lorraine Warren received a mysterious call from a Mrs. Sandy Foster in the middle of the night, only to have the phone connection mysteriously severed. The following day, Lorraine visited the Fosters and learned of the disturbing occurrences plaguing their household. Meg, the daughter, had unwittingly invited dark spirits by dabbling in the occult, and the family experienced a series of terrifying events. I'm talking the classic faucets turned on by themselves, phantom footsteps echoed throughout the house, and strange lights and sounds plagued their nights. So, go and Lorraine, they stepped in to confront the menacing presence. They discovered that Meg's bedroom was a hub of occult activities. They discovered that Meg's bedroom was quite the hub of occult activities, containing black conjuring candles, occult vestments, and ritual books. Rut -row. They sealed the room, removing the sinister artifacts, and as they worked to dispel the evil, they encountered a chilling telepathic feeling of dread and an inexplicable force preventing them from ascending any kind of stairs. Despite these challenges, Ed and Lorraine persevered. With holy water and prayers, they successfully cleansed the house of the malevolent entities. The case serves as a haunting reminder of the dangers of dabbling in the occult and potential consequences of summoning forces beyond human comprehension. See? I told y'all. Don't summon beings. Number three, the Snedeker family rosary beads. As you might have expected, this true story begins in the witching hour, in the wee small hours of the morning. One night, very, very late at night, Ed and Lorraine were contacted by the family, who had just moved into a house on Meriden Avenue in Southington. Specifically, the mother of the family unit and a niece who came to stay with the family were on the phone. What they found and thought they bought was a big and seemingly welcoming home. But what they didn't know was that it was a former funeral home. Oh, and fun fact, the morticians at the funeral home were allegedly involved in necrophilia, or performing, um, Schmeck's acts with corpses. What used to be the showroom for the coffins was now the young person's room, you know, and uh, oh, just down the hall from that, the place where the bodies were prepared for viewing. So the young boys were the first to start talking about the things that they had seen and experienced, saying they were terrified, and the parents chastised them at first for it, but they were so scared they started sleeping on the floor in the living room. Among the sounds the boys would hear were the sound of uh, chains pulling the coffin upstairs. Only thing was, there was no more coffins. So the woman who called the Warrens were terrified, and with the niece in a small bedroom in the back of the house, and the covers on her bed were uh, levitating around her, like there was a fan blowing them around. You know, no big. And Lorraine said that while the mom was on the phone with her, even more bizarre events started happening. The mother had rosary beads in her hand, and while she spoke, the beads were actually being pulled apart and falling to the floor. So Ed and Lorraine went over the next morning with the family's parish priest. A blessing of the house seemed to do nothing to calm things down, so that's when the Warrens decided to call the bishop's office. Eventually sent an exorcist, which seemed to do the trick. But not before one last hurrah from whatever was believed to be haunting the house, because demons don't like to give up without a fight. There was a huge tree in front of the house, and half of the tree, with no wind, broke off and fell in the proper. The family moved a short time later, and Ed and Lorraine kept the rosary beads that had been pulled apart, because if a demonic spirit can touch a Catholic relic, that's just a really bad thing. Number two, Bathsheba's jewelry box. Soon after the Perron family moved into what they thought was a really fun home, strange occurrences began to unravel, initially dismissed as minor inconveniences. We're talking brooms moved on their own, and the young daughters started seeing apparitions. Carolyn Perron, determined to uncover the truth, delved into the history of the house and discovered a lineage plagued by mysterious and tragic deaths spanning eight generations. The most ominous presence was that of Bathsheba Sherman, a woman associated with witchcraft. Bathsheba's malevolent intentions became evident as the family's life spiraled into a nightmare. One harrowing incident involved Carolyn experiencing an inexplicable 
noticeable puncture wound on her calf, resembling a large sewing needle impalement. This unsettling occurrence was just one of the many tormenting episodes endured by the Piron family over their decade long residency in the house. Thankfully, the Warrens got summoned to help the family, and they identified a cursed artifact, a mysterious box, which they believed acted as a conduit for the evil energy afflicting the household. So they took it with them. End of story. Thank goodness. Number one, don't open the box. In Jewish folklore, a dibuk is an evil spirit. Supposedly, a Holocaust survivor accidentally summoned the demon while using a homemade Ouija board, but managed to trap it inside a wine cabinet. Kevin Manis bought the box at an estate sale in 2001 and immediately started having nightmares about an evil hag. Ditto for the friends who stayed with him. He gave the box to his mom, who suffered a stroke on the same day, and later owners have also claimed that uh, the scary thing has appeared in their nightmares as well. Thankfully, at some point, the owner contacted local rabbis, sealed the demon back in the box, and then hid it from the world. Thank goodness. Maximilian Robespierre. It is pretty well known conception when it comes to the French. Riots, p protests, and petitions and revolutions are pretty coherent. Every time the citizens of France are pissed off about something, you can guarantee they'll be on the streets and ready to go. But when did this start? Well, in 1789, when King Louis XVI needed more money, he failed to raise taxes. And when he had called a meeting with the state general, a man named Maximilien Robespierre came about after he was inspired to become a political advocate for the revolutionary cause. Especially since the fact that he defended the will of the people with such conviction that he was nicknamed the incorruptible at the time. But as always, when it comes to political leaders, that title can only last for so long. Because the idea and title of being such a sudden spokesperson for the people entered his head, he concluded that those who opposed him also meant opposing the people, which again wasn't true. Just because you're a spokesperson for the people doesn't mean you represent all the people. As political leaders and representatives, your role is to listen to the people even if individually they criticize you. You still need to take into consideration for effective leadership. And although we can get into the deeper details, eventually after hundreds and thousands of people died and successes of committees and policies, the Republic was still in danger as Maximilian com commented on criminals disguising themselves as patriots. In summary, the use of the guillotine was used about 16,594 times, and in the end, victims of the massacres were noted as they were caught in the crossfires of the patriotic bloodshed. In the end, his quasi-dictatorship obsession came to the end when he himself, Maximilian, was also guillotined. Number 9, Beverly Ellett. Uh, like all ordinary people, it all starts with a specific moment in time where a switch is flipped and you no longer see yourself as the bad guy, or if there's a sense of self-awareness, maybe you do know, but you just can't stop. In the cases of Beverly Alec, she was actually always into the idea of taking care of somebody. And when she was young, she had the tendency to practice medical stuff, like play a nurse or do gauzes and cast. But it wasn't in a form of, oh, I want to learn how to be a nurse. It was more so of like, hey, I'm hurt. Can you pay attention to me kind of thing. Even to the point, the obsession and desperation of being paid attention to would lure her to causing inflictions onto to herself and then convince her own doctor to even remove her healthy appendix. She then left school and at 16 took a course in nursing as this was in 1968 so everyone was just doing things very early on. And as soon as she finished her course, however, she got into a hospital and in six months of hell, specifically over a period of 59 days, she would harm and kill over a dozen children. Every child under her care would suffer from cardiac arrest, chest pains, life support, and insulin overdose. The sad part was, because she was a pediatric nurse, people trusted her fully with their children, thinking she was taking care of their kids, but after staff grew skeptic of another child's death, that's when they found out she had access to drugs and eventually led to her arrest. When she was being interviewed, she apparently laughed, smiled, smirking that she wouldn't go to jail. But justice prevails, and as on May 1993, she was sentenced to life in prison. Number eight, James Patterson Smith. When it comes to toxic relationships, this is an important note that there are sources out there when you don't know if you are in one. And as well as another note, if you feel like the person has to hurt you to love you, I'm gonna tell you right now that is not what that is. Find people who care about you, and if it got physical, just call authorities. In the case of Kelly Ann Bates, she was unfortunately groomed by James Patterson Smith when she was just 14 years old. She was babysitting for friends, and Smith had an odd impact on Kelly, but what's more odd was that he was 45 years old. A 45-year-old man was hitting on a 14-year-old. And when Kelly tried to introduce him to her mom, she was livid, and she said, Kelly, this man is bad and not a good man, and hair would actually rise at the back of her mom's neck. She was right. After four weeks straight, Kelly would be tormented, harmed, attacked, and be left with injuries so extensive that when they found her drowned body in the bathtub, authorities know it was something they just haven't seen before, especially how her eyes were gouged out. Prosecutors noted that the trial had, in quote, it was like Smith was trying to deliberately disfigure her, causing her the utmost pain, distress, and degradation. The injuries were not the result of sudden eruption of violence, but a torment that caused over time. They eventually noted that Smith was delusional and had a distorted reality with paranoia and morbid jealousy. It only took the jury only one hour to sentence the man to life. 
Number seven, Basil Zaharoff. When it comes to a good salesman, from what I've been told from friends who used to do door to door or do retail and the require of commissions, they always tell me that it's about human connection. And as for Basil Zaharoff, he was viewed as a master of bribery and corruption. Considered as the mystery man of Europe, you're looking at the most important people of the time when it comes to influencing the political scene in Europe with his arms deals. On both sides, he would actually sell weapons where he'd be dubbed merchant of death. He didn't care which side he was selling to, just as long as he was selling, after all, considering the current times, war is a business. Not even at the expense of civilians or human life as a whole, to men like Basil, they only care about money. Even today, despite his transactions, they remain a mystery as he took up two days burning as much evidence as possible. After the First World War, he wanted more money and focused on the conflicts in Greece where he single-handedly convinced both parties between Venizelos and King Constantine to use his weapons against each other. He was basically playing Sims, but in real life. In the end, his life was shaped by seizing opportunity wherever he could find it, and through his self-serving businesses dealings, he helped shape the power dynamics of Europe and thus played an instrument part in the history of the continent. Number six, Brenda Spencer. I Don't Like Mondays is a song by Boomtown Rats and a famous co-op by our favorite cat, Garfield. But for the 16 year old Brenda Spencer, who the song Boomtown Rats is based off of, is one of that's very concerning. Brenda Spencer had killed two adults and wounded eight children in a sniper attack on a San Diego elementary school in 1979. The reason, she said, it was just because she didn't like Mondays. And she had a very specific color that she liked, and if you were wearing it that day, you were shot. Her parents were separated when she was young, and she was left in the custody of her dad. And her father did try to bond with her after noting she had a knack for shooting birds with a BB he took on himself to get her a semi automatic. Why? I don't know either. But he could have just taken her to like the mall or something. But apparently, according to Brenda, she said the reason why her dad got her the weapon was because she knew he, she was depressed and there was rumors that she wanted to take her own life. The morning of the event that took place is when her separated father left home and she was supposed to be at school, but it was noted by her teachers she had no interest in academics. And so she lived next to an elementary school and when she saw the children and the adults around, that's when she fired. Eventually, further casualties were reduced when the police moved a van that obscured her vicinity and she was eventually apprehended. After a deep psych eval, she was pleaded guilty and was sentenced to 25 years to life. Number five, Candence Elizabeth Newmaker. When you grew up in an unstable home, there are cases, if not most cases, especially if the child is unable to have any rehabilitation of security or sense of safety. The child, psychologically speaking, is for the lack of a better word, traumatized. After Candace Elizabeth Newmaker's parents were caught for their negligence of Candace and her siblings, Child Protective Services took her away. As a result, she was later adopted by a single woman and a pediatric nurse named Jean Elizabeth Newmaker. But after months of adoption, Candace was reacting pretty not good and she was very aggressive, according to Jean. She, was even, she even killed her pet goldfish and started playing with matches. Keep in mind this was all under the allegation of Jean as she would also give Candace medication and take her to a psychiatrist due to her reckless behavior. In the year 2000, Jean took Candace to a pseudoscientist by the name of Cornell Watkins and, who didn't have a license to do a two week intensive attachment therapy program that cost $7,000. She found this so called psychiatrist from another licensed psychologist named William Goebel. After two weeks, Candace died from the so called rebirthing session and the goal of this so called rebirthing required an individual, in this case the child, to mimic a simulate womb covered by flannel sheets and pillows. Candace was held down by four adults where she was begging and pleading that she couldn't breathe. She yelled 11 times that she was dying, to which the people involved named Julie Ponder said, go ahead and die right now, for real. After 20 minutes, Candace threw up, excreted inside the sheet, and despite, they still restrained her. 40 minutes after, they asked her if she wanted to be reborn, and she responded no. They yelled at her that she was a quitter, and at the end of the session, she realized that she was motionless, her fingertips were blue, and Jean, who was watching the session from another room, took notice and tried to do CPR. They called 911, and when they were able to get a pulse, but eventually Candace died from, a, from being brain dead from asphyxia. Considering this was all videotaped, these so-called therapists were sentenced to prison sentences, convicted of reckless child harm. And after that, the US House of Rep passed Candace Law in Colorado and North Carolina, preventing reenactments of the so-called birth experience. Number four, Delphine LaLaurie. Delphine LaLaurie was also known as Madame LaLaurie, who was a New, Lor New Orleans socialite of French Creole descent who lived in the 19th century. She was infamous for her association for one of the most notorious instances of cruel and harm in American history. So reports suggest that slaves who were owned by Delphi were found in a state of extreme physical harm and torment as reportedly chained to walls. Others were confined in small cages and others shown signs of severe mutilation. The exact details and extent of the atrocities vary in historical accounts, with some describing brutal experiments and inhumane treatment. As the news of the discovery spread, a mob of outraged citizens attacked the mansion. However, Delphi and her family managed to escape before facing any legal consequence, of course. After leaving New Orleans, Delphi's exact fate 
date is unclear as there are different accounts of where she went and what happened to her. The Lori Mansion has also been noted as a haunted house as ghost stories and legends as it's also considered to be one of the most haunted places in New Orleans. Number 3, HJSY. If you were in Japan in the 70s, you might know this horrific and tragic story of Junko Furuta. A once motivated, popular, and beautiful high school student was headed home to watch the final episode of her favorite television show, Tonbo. When suddenly, four deviant horrible high school boys by the name of Hiroshi Miyano, Joe Ogura, Shinji Minato, and Yashishi Watanabe adopted, adopted her and took Junko to Minato's home. There, they were extremely violent as they violated her and allowed other men to violate her as well. From the day of her kidnapping on November 25th to the day that she died on January 4th, under excruciating physical and psychological pain, she was tormented, beaded, lacerated, and even burned. Her appearance drastically deteriorated to the point where she even gave off a rotting smell. After beating and dropping an iron exercise ball in her stomach several times, burning her with hot candles and on her eyelids, forcing her to drink her own urine, Furuta succumbed to her injuries and she died. Less than 24 hours after realizing she had died, they wrapped her body in blankets, shoved her in a body and traveling bag, then placed her body in a 55 US gallon drum and filled it with wet concrete. They then dumped her body in a cement trunk in Tokyo and after they were caught and convicted for another kidnapping and physical harm to another woman, the boys accidentally confessed to the crime of Junko and told police where to find her body. She was finally found and her parents and her classmates and her co-workers found peace knowing she can finally be buried. But these horrible crappy kids were only able to get less than a 10-year sentence and even the mother of one of these horrible delinquents, Ogura, vandalized Furuta's grave saying that the dead girl ruined her son's life. Which to be honest, after these guys were released, they ended up doing more crime anyway and got arrested for that. Either way, the tragic crime of Junko Furuta had echoed as one of the most horrible crimes committed in Japan. Number two, Gamal Pasha, also known as executioner of the Armenian genocide alongside other members of the CUP. During his tenure, Jamal Pasha implemented policies that would lead to the mass deportation and killing of Armenians. He is implicated in the forced marches, massacres, and other brutal actions that resulted in the deaths of hundreds of thousands of Armenians. Pasha was also a key figure in the executions of genocidal policies set forth by the Ottoman government. And after World War I, Pasha fled the Ottoman Empire and sought refuge in Germany. In 1922, he was assassinated by an Armenian revolutionary named Telehiran, Tehilaran was later tried and acquitted by German court, which recognized the massacre of the Armenians as a war crime. So that's good to know, you know, the German court can recognize genocide as a war crime. Pasha's role in the Armenian genocide is remembered as one of the part broader historical narratives surrounding the events of 1915 and 1923, during which the Ottoman Empire systematically targeted and killed a significant portion of Armenian population. The genocide remains as a historical debate, with Turkey officially de denying the term genocide to describe these events. However, many countries and scholars around the world recognize that this was a genocide. Which, if anything, any nation that has the audacity to eradicate a nation of people by displacing them, cutting off their water, killing hundreds and thousands of their children, obliterating generations of family trees, and literally committing violence on civilians is a war crime. It is a genocide. Finally, number one, King Leopold. Although he's a king, a lot of people seem to not know that the trauma inflicted this so-called king had as a significant role in Congo. Congo had suffered his horrible and vicious rule as Leopold acquired control over Congo's free state as his private property during the time when European powers were competing for territories in Africa. While officially presented as a philanthropic and humanitarian venture, Leopold's administration in the Congo was marked by exploitation and brutality. From forcing them by using methods of extracting resources that were often brutal, involving the use of violence, mutilation by cutting off their hands and feet by making them also stare at their loss of and forced labor of the Congolese people. The atrocities committed during this period had been well documented with the estimates of death toll ranging from several hundred thousands to millions. The harsh exploitations along with the disease introduced by outsiders led to significant decline of the people of Congo. Villages were ravaged and families were separated, contributing to the long-lasting impact of Congolese society. But was King Leopold ever accountable for his actions and his crime against the Congolese people? No, of course not. He was a European king and like all colonizers, they always seem to get away with it. Even right now, Congo is going through a massive genocide as they are forced to mine for natural resources and minerals like cobalt for your cell phones. 70% of the world's cobalt for laptops, jet engines, rockets, cameras are all from the mines in Congo. And who's mining them? Children. In 1996, over 6 million have been killed and half of them are children. As there are currently 6.9 million people have been displaced, these crimes in Congo since Leopold still remain, and the tech industry are deeply complicit in the injustices in Congo. 